So many cooks in the kitchen, so many recipes to share. So many cooks in the kitchen with meals for you to prepare. We've got fruits and grains, veggies and beans, more healthy food than you've ever seen. So many cooks in the kitchen, plant-based meals to prepare. So many cooks in the kitchen with ideas we're happy to share. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our next episode of um, So Many Cooks in the Kitchen. Today's episode is So Much Squash. I'm delighted to be with you. My name is Dilla Barman. I'm a Food for Life instructor in Durham, North Carolina. Food for Life is a nutrition education program of the Physicians Committee. And we have instructors like myself. There's about 300 of us around the world. And we love food and we love nutrition, whole food, plant-based nutrition. My wife asked me to explain what is whole food plant-based nutrition. So when we eat vegan, that means we're not eating animal products. And whole food plant-based eating is vegan, but it's more than that. We try to eat food as close to the way mother nature grew it um, with minimal processing. So for example, today we'll be working with squash and it's not edible raw, so we cooked it. So this is not a raw food uh, program, but it's, uh, we're preparing the food with minimal processing. So today we move on to squash. I love squash. There's two kinds of squash, summer and winter squash. Here in the Northern hemisphere, it's fall and uh, it's getting cooler and squash, winter squash is readily available. Um, in the summer, summer squash is very similar, but it's more tender. And when you buy it, you want to um, keep it in the refrigerator and use it within a week. It gets it starts spoiling after about a week. Winter squash, however, uh, keeps for a long time and I just leave it on my counter. It makes a nice decoration and reminds us of the season. So let me show you some kinds of winter squash we have. Winter squash is very nutritive. It's high, it's a good source of vitamins A and number of B vitamins, C and K, and a variety of minerals. It's high in fiber and it's low in the glycemic index. And I'll come back to the glycemic index later when I talk about cinnamon. Glycemic index basically talks about how quickly sugar gets absorbed in the bloodstream. And so you generally want to prefer and favor low glycemic foods, okay? So squash is great. Probably the most common squash that you may be familiar with is acorn squash. It's beautiful and it looks like a huge acorn. Uh, so acorn squash comes in different sizes. Uh, here's some big ones. Some of my squash may tumble and here's a smaller one. Um, you know, with lots of fruits and vegetables, the smaller ones are more tender and taste better. I haven't found that to be the case with squash. I actually prefer smaller ones because they're easier to prepare. Uh, and they take a little less time and they taste equally good. So if you get a big squash, cool. If you get a small squash, cool. Um, this is called carnival squash. And it's called that because of its colors. Uh, and by the way, a lot of squash has a sticker. My family prefers organic, and I can tell it's organic because it starts with nine. I don't know if you can see that in the camera, but it's, it has a code. And if it starts with nine in the United States, that means that it's organic. Um, if you find squash uh, that isn't organically grown, all the squash I find always has been organic. To me, it's not going to be a big issue because the squash, winter squash is a very heavy, um, in most cases, a heavy outside. Um, this is, um, let's see, where's my butternut squash? Oh, I'm missing butternut squash. 
This is butternut squash. I'm surprised I didn't get any butternut squash. Butter, butternut squash looks like a big version of um, honey nut squash. <laughs> so this bulb is big. And one of our cooks later is going to be cooking with uh, butternut squash. And it's very nice. When you cut it in half, it's deep orange inside, creamy and nice. Now that I have honey nut squash in my hand, I'm going to mention this is my new favorite squash. I love it. Uh, it's, it's so sweet. Uh, it's called honey nut squash. Vegans don't eat honey. This has no honey in it, but it's called honey nut, I guess, because it's as sweet as honey. And there are vegan versions of honey, by the way. Um, but it's, it's wonderful. It cooks quickly because it's small and it's tender and creamy and uh, beautiful color as well. It's my favorite. If you can find honey nut squash, I highly recommend it. Um, this is delicata squash right here. Delicata squash is nice. This reminds me a little bit of a summer squash. Uh, it's a little bit more watery. Uh, it's not one of my favorites. I like it. I use it once in a while. And we're later on going to be having somebody who will be cooking with delicata squash. So delicata. I love red curry squash. Uh, it looks like a pumpkin. Pumpkin is also a squash. Um, and um, so red curry squash is quite nice. It's kind of a deep orange color. Uh, the thing I like about red curry is the flavor is nice. It's sweet. It's soft and creamy. When you cut it open, everything is edible. Maybe not the stem. I wouldn't eat the stem. But the skin is edible, as are the seeds. Earlier this week, I made a red curry squash soup. It was very nice. Uh, and I even blended in the skin. Uh, you can eat the skin. The skin is nice. So you get good nutrition. Of course, that's after it's cooked. So, And the seeds are great. The seeds are high in potassium and protein other minerals in general of all squashes. A lot of people like spaghetti squash. This used to be a favorite of mine in college. It's just kind of cool because for spaghetti squash, all you have to do is really bake it or boil it or pressure cook it until it's soft. When you cut it open, you take a fork and you just kind of remove the seeds and tease it with a fork and what comes out looks like pasta. And then you can add your favorite pasta sauce. This is great for our gluten-free friends and I think it used to be used a lot for pastas, you know, some years ago. Now there's so many gluten-free pastas, but it's still a good choice. I find the flavor mild. My daughter, I have an 11 year old, she kind of likes it. I buy it once in a while. To me, it's kind of mild. Um, one of my other new favorites is called, I can remember the name, Robin's Kojinut Squash. And it's named after, I think there was a Robin who passed away. This was hybridized by a gourmet chef he runs a restaurant and he worked with a farmer and they wanted to memorialize a friend of theirs named Robin, I believe. It's a good squash. It's one of my favorites, but to tell you the truth, I actually like honey nut better. It's a similar flavor profile, but I think it shines more in honey nut. So many kinds of squash. One of my favorites is kombucha squash, which is here. It comes in different sizes, of course. Here's a bigger one. And here's a more weathered one. If you have an, art, an artist in your family, this would be a good one to, to paint or draw. Look at all the interesting warts. Um, this is also, this used to be my favorite squash until um, Honey Nut came along. So today what I'm going to do, all the recipes for our show, and today we're going to be covering so many dishes. There's nine of us. Um, uh, I can't pronounce it because I don't speak Spanish, but we're, one of our cooks, Mark, is going to be showing us sopa calabachita. And when he comes, he'll correct the pronunciation. We're going to be making uh, taco, uh, squash tacos, and uh, even a cheese sauce. So that's going to be pretty interesting. Okay. So how do you make squash? So we're talking about winter squash. Uh, generally, uh, the, I think the hard way, the way I used to do it for most of my life, is I would take the squash and I would cut it, pretend I'm cutting it. Now this is hard to do, and you can you can hurt yourself, right? And by the way, if you're cooking, it's not a matter of if, but when you will cut yourself. And I actually did cut myself last week. So make sure you know where your first aid kit is. So with winter squash, this is the old way that I used to do it. I would cut it in half, use a big knife and be very careful. Remove the seeds, which is a bit difficult. Put it face down in a shallow dish with maybe a half inch of water and bake it at about 375 degrees. And, and I can't do the con conversion in my head, but that's US Fahrenheit, 375 degrees Fahrenheit for 45 to 60 minutes and maybe more. Take a fork to the outside and touch it. And if it's, if it's tender and it's done, then your squash is ready. My friend, Lady Mullerath, she taught me an excellent way to cook squash. And that's what I do now. All I do is I just rinse the squash. I put it in my pressure cooker on a trivet. This is a trivet and you see it has legs. So it's, it doesn't sit on the, uh, the squash won't sit on the bottom of the pressure cooker. 
I put about a half uh, cup of water, pressure cooking cooks with steam, and then I pressure steam it. I have an instant pot. There's a setting called pressure steam. So I pressure steam it for um, uh, about eight minutes. If it's a small squash, if it's a bigger squash, maybe 10, 12 minutes. And then what I do is uh, I prepare the squash. So now we'll see how easy it is. Let's get a little close up. My knife goes right through it like it's butter. Okay, so here comes the squash. I'm cutting it in half. And what I did with this, with this um, squash is I undercooked it a little bit because to be honest, the recipe I've shared, the recipe is available at bit.ly, bit.ly slash so much squash recipes. And you capitalize all the words. It's, it's on, you'll see, the, see it listed. But it, it gets a little bit hard to work with because it gets a little too soft. So let me just show you what it looks like. So you can see there's the squash. And what I would do is I would cook it even more so, uh, so that it's really soft and it's okay if it's messy. Let me see if I can remove the top half. There we go. And you can see all the seeds in here. So what I would do is I would remove all the seeds. If you want to store them, dry them and, and roast them, you can. And then what I would do is, let me get a spoon. So I'm going to, with the spoon, the fastest thing is just in the sink because I have a disposer here. I'm going to get rid of the seeds or save them as I mentioned. It's nice and soft so the seeds come right out. Okay. And then in the interest of time, because I'm running out of time, I want to show you what I'm going to do next. So I pressure cooked some split peas, the recipe you have of course, and here's my split peas. So what I did is I cooked some split peas and all the ratios are, in the, uh, are available. So there's the split peas. You can use yellow or green split peas. I put some, uh, I put, uh, some spinach, I put some carrots, I put water or broth, and there it is. I'm going to mix it. It cooked for, I think it was eight to 10 minutes is what I recommended. And it's nice and liquidy. I generally like cooking it longer so it's thicker. This is going to be our dinner today and our dinner is some hours away. So I cooked it for a little bit um, uh, less time. So it's a little bit more liquidy. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some onion. I like to add onion at the end because if you add it too early, then it loses a lot of its flavor. So there goes the onion. Now, by the way, if you don't have a pressure cooker, you can cook your split peas stovetop and that takes about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, but I like my pressure cooker and I like to call this my power plate kabucha squash dal. So power plate because we have vegetables like the spinach, legumes like the split pea, grains. I also put a little bit of cracked wheat. Sorry, you can put quinoa or some other grain. This we got from an Indian store. My wife picked this up. This is called in Hindi dalia, but it's also cracked wheat. So I put a little cracked wheat. So we have whole grains uh, and we're gonna mix all that in. And finally, I discovered this wonderful grape. Muscadine is a kind of Southern grape and it, it's more pronounced with the, the anti-cancer properties that grapes have, it has uh, that grapes have, but it's even more so in muscadines. And I wish I had some fresh ones we picked last week. When you get them fresh, they're just beautiful. But what I did is I did freeze some. You can see these musket, these, uh, they're called rasmataz. They're a muscadine with no seed, very thin skin, and just wonderful. There's a local farm that grows these. I'm so delighted. Union Grove Farm, if you're here in North Carolina, they grow them and they're so good. So I'm going to mix these in and I'm going to invite my daughter, Anu, to come and take a sample. So it's an interesting flavor combination. We add fruit. I like the fruitiness and the sweetness, the juiciness. I'm just gonna reuse this bowl. So sweetie, grab a spoon for yourself. Anu is one of our kids in the kitchen. We have a program called So Many Kids in the Kitchen. So here is my kabocha squash dal with rasmataz grapes. How's that look? So Anu, please give it a try. Come on closer to me. So while she tries it, tell us what you think. I have to tell you, she doesn't generally like squash. And this week I've been making a number of squash dishes. And what have you said about my squash dishes this week? The first ones I did not like at all, but then- At all? Yeah. But then the next ones were much better. And I've already tried this one, so I know it's great. Oh, wow, so good. It tastes even better with the grapes in there. So the grapes added a nice, nice foil. So thank you for watching me. I'm so excited because we're now going to go to Italy 
with Janan Orhun, and she's going to be talking about oven roasted squash. Take it away, Janan. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, what a nice introduction you gave to all the everything squash, Dilip. It's wonderful. Uh, welcome to my kitchen at Cascina Gallorsi. Here I am in Italy, joining you all again. So excited. Um, this evening, I will talk all about roasting squash. And for that, I've chosen a butternut squash. Uh, here, they call it a um, violina, violin squash. And so basically, I'll just start telling you first about roasting. Roasting is a dry heat method of cooking, as opposed to the broil, uh, boiling, steaming, braising. And the really high heat uh, browns the sugars, the natural sugars in the vegetable, caramelizing them and pronouncing a very sweet, intense, earthy flavor. And to do that, we need to use really high temperatures. Um, basically, you um, chop your vegetables. Uh, this time, okay, we have the, uh, the butternut squash. And today I've chosen to cut them into just about one inch squares. Squash being squash, it's really uneven, so hard to cut into even um, sizes. But you coat it with a tiny bit of oil and then you put it on into your hot oven. Um, the oil helps to coat the vegetable, keeping the moisture in and allowing it to heat evenly and quickly. Therefore, the caramelization is happening even faster and better. However, if you're uh, on a diet with no oil, you could also use some vegetable broth or um, a white balsamic vinegar works really well as well. It doesn't change the color of the vegetable and it still provides that coating to um, help with the roasting process. Um, so I um, put some, um, I put some squash already in the oven, it's cooking, but since we don't have as much time, I'm gonna show you this first. You, you take your squash, you cut it in half, you take the seeds out um, and like Dilip said, you can either toss them out or um, keep them. I like keeping them um, slightly toasted um, seeds with a little bit of salt. They're lovely, even without salt, they're lovely. Uh, or you can keep them for next year's vegetable garden. So that's helpful. And you cut your squash and then you need to peel it. Um, this one you have to peel. So I use um, a carrot peeler and just quickly peel it. And as you can see, it goes okay. Then you try to keep it um, even slices. So here we go. I'm happy more or less even sized pieces. And then you add just a tiny bit of oil to coat your vegetables. Um, so here I have my spoon. Just to make sure we don't get too much. So you see just a little less than a, a tablespoon and coat them really well. And in the meantime, you can also put just a, a tiny bit of salt and a tiny bit of pepper as well. Um, of course, you can use um, herbs such as um, thyme or oregano or rosemary as well. And depending on the, the flavor profile you want to achieve, then the best way to do is to use a heavy duty cookie sheet um, because flimsy ones warp with the intense heat. And one thing I try to take care is not to dump it onto my cookie sheet because there might be excess oils and you don't want the excess oils. Another trick to roasting is to ensure that your vegetables are spaced. They're not one on top of each other. And that's because then they can all cook evenly and um, really well. So here they are on my cookie sheet and I will try to arrange them a little bit better. And one other thing to keep in mind is that um, the perimeters of your oven 
is usually hotter. So when you chop your vegetables, if there are a few larger slices, try to keep them on the outer edges and make sure that you put the tinier ones, you see this looks tinier, I'll move it to the side and here's the bigger ones, on the edges, therefore allowing them to cook evenly. And um, so I'm gonna put this in the back because I have in the oven already some already cooking, which I will show you. And one good thing to remember if you um, roasted butternut squash or any squash for that matter, is to make sure if you're serving it right away as a side dish and they're really delicious as, um, as a side dish. Here's the freshly baked ones, uh, roasted ones. You can, um, don't burn yourself. Um, here they are, they look lovely. And if you can just smell them, that's the next trick. We always say we would like to have the video with the aroma in it too. You can see they're nicely baked. And a good test is that the knife should go in and out easily. That shows that it's done. They're beautifully roasted. And the better thing to do is to serve it on a, a flat dish because then they won't um, the ones at the bottom won't get all smooshy and, and soft. So here's the beautifully uh, oven roasted butternut squash. Now, if I was going to use this butternut squash for flavoring my risotto, for example, I would have cut them smaller and kept the oven temperature, instead of 400 degrees, I would have started at 450. The reason being is smaller um, and sturdy um, vegetables, when put into a hotter oven, cook quicker and better. The, the larger you cut them, the lower the temperature ought to be to allow for even cooking and perfect cooking. So, um, like I said, they make perfect um, side dish, but you can also roast them and then turn them into a soup, which is also excellent. It really gives that added flavor to your um, squash soup. You could use it for um, flavoring your risotto or salads or many other options. And having said that, um, our next presenter, Denise Houchin from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, will be presenting a farro salad with roast uh, butternut squash. So you will see another use for butternut squash, roasted butternut squash in another um, recipe. But as I always say, this is one of those things that we demonstrate and I'd like to say, please do try it at home. It's wonderful. And before I say goodbye, I say arrivederci and Denise, take it away, it's all yours. I look forward to seeing your recipe, Denise. Bye everybody. Well, thank you so much, John. Yes, we're gonna be, uh, I'm gonna be showing another recipe with butternut squash. And you know, there's so many cooks in the kitchen and there's so much squash and there's so many ways to prepare it. So. Um, squash is endless. You can use it in desserts and savory dishes and appetizers. Um, it's really, it's really great. Okay, um, so the butternut squash, the way that I do it is similar. Um, I go ahead and I just cut the end off. Just the tip. And then I'll do the same to the bottom. Slice it off. Then I take, I, my vegetable peeler is um, a Titan. This is one of the best vegetable peelers I've ever seen. You can get them in a two pack where it'll be a julienner and then this one. So these peelers are, they will peel through any hard squash, anything that's, um, I think we got some background noise going on there. Let me see if we can get that fixed. I think it's there. Okay, good. 
anyway, it just, um, you can just slice it really easily. But one of the things I wanted to show you, I'm not gonna take the time to peel this whole thing, is once I do this, whoops. I don't know, maybe we, the host can, can mute somebody. Okay, anyway, down here is where the seeds are. And so I always just start cutting about a half an inch slice. So I'll just cut it about this thick and I will cut it all the way down until I get to the bowl. Now, when I get it like this, you know, of course it will be peeled, but then I just take it and I just slice it in little strips and I turn them and I slice them in cubes. And so for what I'm making, I like the small cubes. So as you can see, they're, you know, about half inch, quarter inch size. So that's the way that I like to, to make mine. And I put them, I don't use oil, so I just threw them in the, um, in a bowl. I put them in a bowl like this, and I put some salt and um, just a little bit of salt and garlic powder. I love garlic in it. And then I put them on my cookie sheet that has a silicone mat and I put them in the oven for 400 and I put them for five minutes and I check it and I give them a little flip. And then it's usually just about another um, five, six minutes when they're this small, it doesn't take long. I don't like them to be real mushy and I like them to be cold. So before I make this salad, I always put these in the fridge. So I'm gonna go on to the um, dressing. And this is a garlicky lemon dressing. So this is my magic bullet. It has seen, it's had a good life. And I like to use it when I make smaller amounts. I have my Vitamix that I use for larger amounts, but I love my Nutribullet. So I have three tablespoons of lemon juice, three tablespoons of white balsamic, balsamic vinegar. The white gives it a light color and it's a, it's a little bit lighter in flavor. I really like the white balsamic. And you can get flavored, this would be good with, um, you can get flavored balsamics that have lemon, I have peach and pineapple, and that would even be pretty tasty to put just a, a tablespoon of the flavored in there. These are organic hemp seeds. They're full of omega-3s and uh, just full of goodness. And they make it kind of creamy. That's why I like to use them. Instead of using nuts um, or beans, I will use hemp seeds sometimes. Now the recipe called for um, aquafaba, which is the, the liquid that comes out of the bean, the can of beans, but I used all of mine up. So I just put a little broth. I replaced it with broth. And one of the things I'm going to show you today is that, you know, recipes are great when you're trying to figure out what it is you like, but I don't use recipes very often. I like to look at recipes and then I go in the kitchen with similar ingredients and I just make my own. So today we're going to be doing some substitutions. So you can see that you know, you might not have pistachios, but that's okay because look, we got pumpkin seeds. They're gonna work just fine. So oregano and then maple syrup. It's pure maple syrup, not um, pancake syrup, not anchovy syrup. And then I have some garlic powder, a little bit of sea salt and black pepper. And then I uh, used my microplane and got the lemon peel. From before I juiced the lemon, I did the peel. Okay, so we're just gonna put the lid on this and plug in it. Hopefully it won't be loud. Taste of this. Oh my, this is amazing. I'm going to blend it just a little bit more to get all those hemp seeds ground in there. All right, and the dressing is done. Now, normally when I make this salad, I like to make extra dressing. And then I will put it in little two ounce containers and I'll freeze them. And that way when I make salads and I need a dressing, I don't have to make a whole batch. I can just pull those out of the freezer and I'm good to go. All right, so now we're gonna get our big old bowl. And the first thing I'm gonna do is put uh, farro. Now farro is a ancient grain. It's real chewy. 
I love the chewiness uh, and the, the texture of this. And um, it is low in gluten. Now I'm not celiac, but I gluten, um, I'm gluten intolerant, I guess you could say. It, it does give me challenges, but farro does not. I can eat farro several days in a row and I never have an issue with it. So I just wanna put that out there for those who are gluten-free. Um, this is not a gluten-free, but it's a low gluten grain. So it works fabulously. All right, so I have my farro. That was um, one cup cooked, uh, one cup uncooked with two cups of water. And uh, it made just under four cups, like three and three quarters cup. And then this was one squash, the same size as the one that I showed you. And it made right at three cups. So it's perfect for this recipe. And if you have leftover, more power to you. So I'm just gonna blend these a little bit. Now the recipe that I have for you, it calls for um, pomegranates. I had a challenge with pomegranates here in South Dakota. Went to the grocery store, there were no pomegranates. Went to another grocery store, I found some little tiny shriveled up hard pomegranates, but I bought one for $3. Got it home and cut it and it was no good inside. So I went back out to another store and no pomegranates. So I get to improvise. So today I'm using cranberries, dried cranberries. Now these are, um, they're sweetened in fruit juice. So there's no sugar in them. That's the kind of dried fruit I like. And uh, there's no sulfurs or anything. That's why they are so dark. They're not going to be the, the bright red that you see with um, craisins. And then I have mulberries. I don't know if you've ever had dried mulberries. I order these off Amazon in a bag like this, organic mulberries. They're chewy, they're a cross between a raisin and a date for me, that's the, the flavor, um, but I love the texture of them. So I decided to combine some mulberries and cranberries. I'm gonna throw those in. And then pistachios, I just didn't have pistachios, but I had a whole bunch of um, pipkits or pumpkin seeds. So I just throw these in a hot skillet for about two, three minutes. And I just, you know, shook the pan a little bit until they got a little bit toasty. Some of them started popping. And I'm gonna throw those in. And then I'll just stir this, give it a quick stir. And I love the cranberries or the, if you have pomegranate arrows, um, they're very tasty also. Now I'm, I like the sweetness of it, but I don't like a lot. So if you like more, you can put more cranberries in there, certainly. And that's the fun thing about making food. You make it how you like it. All right, so now I'm gonna pour in. Um, the recipe says to pour this over um, the grain and the um, squash and let it marinate. You can do that if you want, it doesn't have to. Again, you get to be innovative. I know Dilip is always encouraging people to try new things and try recipes, make up their own. He likes to make up his recipes. I think most of us cooks do. And that's what makes it fun in the kitchen is when we can create and you don't have to worry if you're out of an ingredient. Well, it's an opportunity to improvise. So do something creative. All right. This is now I'm going to serve this on some arugula and a spinach mix. And I'm just going to scoop it up. Now, if I was serving this for a a dinner party, I would probably take a little bit of um, dark uh, balsamic glaze and drizzle just a little bit over and then throw some sprouts on top and just to give it a real elegant look. But here is your dish and this is so delightful. It does save, you know, if I make this much like for myself, if I were going to make this, I would not put the dressing on all of it. I would put the dressing on just what I was going to eat that day or the next day. And that way it just stays fresher and it lasts longer. Um, so if you're serving a whole family, like I'm going to be sharing this later today, then we'll eat it and you won't have to worry about that. So I hope that you enjoy um, experimenting with squash. Butternut squash is, I think, one of the, well, they're, I love all squash. So butternut squash is, I think it's an easy one to work with. And um, I, I like the way it cuts. You know, you can, you can cut this, throw it right in your high power blender, your Vitamix and blend it with some coconut milk. You can make soup. You don't even have to cook the squash first. And then you can throw it on the stove 
and heat it up with your different spices and you can have a soup that's very quick and easy because it's already blended so you don't have to cook the squash. It will cook as it warms. So that's another quick and easy squash recipe. All right, so now I'm gonna pass this off to Susanna Dickman and she is a couple states east in Evansville, Indiana. So take it away, Susanna. Thanks, Denise. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here again. And today I'm going to make some spaghetti squash with lentil, a lentil marinara. And the one thing you can see, I have my spaghetti squash half already cooked. The one thing about spaghetti squash is that it is really um, a challenge to cut. So I encourage you to be careful. And a tip that I can give you is when I am cutting it, so I always like to cut off the stem um, so that I can have a flat surface. And then it's really a good idea to kind of score where you want to cut so that your knife can then go in and you'll have less chance of it moving and cutting yourself. Um, you can cook spaghetti squash whole, but again, for this recipe, I needed to cook it and cut it in half. And I cut it lengthwise because I'm gonna stuff this with our lentils and marinara. I love spaghetti squash. And um, as uh, you heard Anu say, she liked spaghetti squash too. I find that children, my sons would eat spaghetti squash when they wouldn't eat other types of squash. Now that they're grown, they do like all types of squash, but it is just a great option. It's a high, um, it's a nutrient dense food. That means that it is, has lots of nutrients and it's very low calories. So people, a lot of people like to use it in place of pasta. And that's what I'm going to do today. So I already um, cooked my squash. I cooked this, it's about maybe it was a two pound squash. And another lesson I learned while cooking, especially spaghetti squash is, you know, you can check online and it'll say 40 to 50 minutes. Some recipes will tell you almost an hour. Now, when I was a beginning cook, when I first got married and learning, I did what the recipe said. And oftentimes I would get mushy spaghetti squash. Um, I always make sure, like this was about two pounds and it actually took about 35 minutes to cook because you wanna make sure that it's crunchy. Unless you like it to be softer, then I would cook it um, at a longer time. I put it in the oven at 400 degrees and I always, since I was cooking squash too long, I always try to set the timer for half the time. And then I'll go back and check it and then determine, do I need five minutes more? Do I need to go the whole other 20 minutes if it was 40 minutes that I was cooking? So I would recommend that you do that with the spaghetti squash. So the first thing I'm going to do, you can see it's still kind of together. Now I cooked this this morning and it's been sitting in the fridge cooling. I am just going to take my fork and I am going to scrape it away from the skin. And just, you can see it's in the strands and that's why people like to use this in place of pasta. And it's got that crunch and the texture that you get from pasta. So I'm just gonna move it all around and get it off the skin. And then I am going to mix my marinara and lentil sauce and we're going to put it in our squash. I think that's pretty good. I'm gonna kind of make like a little bowl here. So I'm gonna move some of my squash up on the side and spaghetti squash, as I said, it's got a lot of nutrients. It's got antioxidants, beta carotene, high in vitamin C. Um, it is just so healthy. All right, so I've kind of made like a little hole there where I can put my sauce in. 
and now for my sauce, I am using lentils. You can use brown or green. I found green lentils. You might be able to find canned lentils. Um, we had a grocery store here that did have canned lentils, but they don't have them anymore. So I just brought some dried lentils and I cooked them for about 15 minutes this morning. Um, only it only took, um, I cooked a couple of lentils. And then I have a marinara sauce. Now you can make your own marinara sauce. This one um, is a store bought. You want to look, I prefer to look for one that has no oil. And I'm really able to find a no oil marinara sauce in almost every grocery store in my area. And that is it, okay? The marinara sauce has um, spices, it has garlic. So I really don't need to spice it. Obviously it's your preference, sometimes I will um, buy the jarred marinara sauce and then add some cooked green or red peppers, some onions, um, other spices if I want them. It's all up to you. Next, I'm going to take my sauce and I'm just going to put it in my squash. And um, I know it looks like a lot of sauce, but I'm going to go ahead and fill it up because I like a lot of sauce. Now, um, this one person could eat this whole one by themselves or <laughs> you can share it, it's up to you. But I just think the presentation of keeping this in the um, container, in the, in the squash skin just makes it really, really pretty. Um, I'm going to put this in the oven and bake it for about 20 minutes. You want it to get warm. And then I'm going to top it with a vegan Parmesan. And I'm going to make that real quick. For my vegan Parmesan, I'm going to use cashews. You can use almonds too. If you use almonds, you want to use slivered almonds and you want to make sure they don't have the skin. But I'm just going to put in some cashews. I have some nutritional yeast, some garlic powder, and a little bit of salt. Um, the salt is optional. If you don't want to put it in, don't. And I'm just going to grind this up and we will have a little Parmesan to put over our Okay, let me see how that looks. That looks pretty good. So just a little Parmesan to add to our meal. And I'm just gonna sprinkle some on and then, as I said, this is going to go in the oven. You can add some fresh basil. We had a pretty big freeze um, the other night and our basil is no longer um, edible. But here is the other half of my squash finished in the oven for 20 minutes. You can see I love it because the squash has gotten a little crunchy around the edges and browned. And this is just a great dish on a cold um, fall or winter evening. Another thing that I just want to um, recommend is, you know, as squash really doesn't have that much of a flavor profile. So I chose to make a more Italian type stuffing for this squash. If you want to make a Mexican um, stuffing, I would use maybe black beans or pinto beans and some rice or quinoa, maybe add some cumin, green chili, and you've got a whole different flavor profile. I just think spaghetti squash can be that, that base and then you can be creative and add to it. And you'll have a yummy meal that, um, as I said, my children when they were young would just love, they would eat the spaghetti squash up because they like that texture and the, the crunch. So enjoy your spaghetti squash, please um, be careful. 
cutting it, you know, make sure you um, get that score into the side of it so that you are able to cut it. And thank you for watching. Next, we have Angelita and she is going to be making a delicious squash dish for you. Thanks for watching everyone. Take care. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Angelita Hughes. I am in Greenville, South Carolina. And today I will be making a stuffed uh, acorn squash for everyone. Um, <clears throat> so as Dillip explained at the beginning, about the different squashes, which he did a wonderful job and I'm excited to try the honey squash. Uh, so here is the egg corn squash and this is what it looks like on the inside. It's full of lots of seeds. Um, I don't ever get rid of the seeds. I'm a seed saver. So I take the seeds and I scoop them out. I put them in a little colander with some water like this so I can get them away from the membrane or separate them from the membrane. And I do one of two things with them. I lay them out in a paper towel once they're nice and clean, this is what you have, and let them dry completely. Usually I give them about a week. And once they're completely dry, then I store them in a mason jar and I use them to plant for next year. Or when they're wet like this, I season them with Cajun seasoning or black seasoning, and I put them in my air fryer for air crisp, uh, the air crisp uh, option. And I let them cook at 375 for about four to five minutes. And that just roasts them beautifully or crisps them up beautifully. And then I use them in soups, salads, pastas, you name it. Um, so that's what I do with them. Uh, the membrane I do put in my compost file because I don't get rid of anything. So how we, how I do that is I just take a big spoon and I just go around the sides like this and I just scoop everything out. Once everything has been scooped out, I have my oven preheating if I'm not using my um, air fryer, but I have it preheating at 375 and with just a little paring knife, I kind of just pierce the inside of the acorn squash and the same seasonings that I'm going to be using in the stuffing and you will have the recipe um, or you can ask for the recipe during the Q and A uh, after this segment. So I take a little bit of the seasoning and I rub it on the inside and I put these face down on a parchment sheet and I put them in the oven at 375 for about 25 to 30 minutes, depending on your oven. But you do want to go in there and flip them halfway through to make sure that you get uh, even cooking but they're not gonna be 100% cooked because we are stuffing them and we're gonna put them back into the oven. Okay, if you're using your air fryer and you use a roasting option on your air fryer, I have the Ninja Foodie and I put mine at 375 for 15 minutes. And at seven to eight minutes, I go in there and I flip them and let them finish cooking. Then I take them out, they, they, I haven't had an issue with them yet. So this is what it looks like on the inside. You can see it's nice and golden as they were speaking about earlier. It's the sugars in there that get nice and golden and it's just absolutely delicious. That's one of my favorite parts. So when you follow the recipe for the dressing, you have two options. You can bake everything and in the oven at 375 for about 25 minutes and you will have a very good seasoned cornbread. Um, or you can buy the pre-made cornbread cubes, which is the, uh, the stuffing mix, and then add all the seasonings to it. I prefer to do it myself because I know exactly what's going in it. And um, if you have allergies and you buy something that's pre-made, it might 
be in, you know, um, excuse me, it might be prepared in a facility that might have something that you might be allergic to. So I'm, I'm not willing to take that chance for myself. Um, so I just do it myself. I bake it the day before. I cube it up and I add all my seasonings, um, excuse me, I add my broth to it and let that sit while my squash is baking. Uh, you can add cranberries to it. You can add uh, really any dried berry to it is really good in there. Also, you can add uh, diced apples. You can add diced pears. Um, any kind of nuts you can add to it as well. Mix it all up and you will see how it comes up nice and moist. And you're gonna fill this, you're gonna put this in the cavity of the acorn squash. You're not gonna compact it. You're gonna put it in there lightly because when you put it back in the oven, you wanna make sure that the heat is able to get through all of it and you have a nice even consistency. So I did put on my gloves, but my hands are still really clean. So this is exactly what you're gonna do. It's just in there nice and light. And you return this back to the oven at 375 for about 20 to 25 minutes. You wanna put a sheet of parchment paper on top. And then on top of that, you wanna put a sheet of foil. Don't put the foil directly onto your food. You put it in the oven, uh, again, 375, 20, 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. It's gonna come out nice and golden. Uh, and when it comes out, uh, you can serve this as a side dish. You can serve it as a main dish. It's really up to you. So this is what it looks like. I already prepared one earlier. And you can see all the brown bits on there. And then, you know, I like to serve with a little extra fruit because you can never get enough. And one of my favorite things to do is to squeeze the juice of a mandarin or a tangerine or just a fresh orange, squeeze that juice on top and let it soak through. Something about the flavor of citrus with this cornbread stuffing just speaks fall to me and it's so comforting. Um, if you wanna serve it as a main dish, then you could serve some steamed vegetables on there uh, with it, and um, you'll be very happy. I hope you guys enjoy this as much as my family enjoys this. I thank you, and now we've got Mark in Chicago, Illinois coming up, and he's going to be showing us how to make a sopa calabacita. So I'm excited, take it away, Mark. Hello, hello everybody. I'm Karen Besita. I work in security. I'm a security guard. <laughs> well, why did the pirate have a pumpkin strapped to his arm? Oh no, I lost my head. Strapped to his arm. He was a squash buckler. What was the pumpkin's favorite sport? Squash. All right, Kala Besita, that's enough. All right, take it away, Mark. Hey everybody, how are you? So Kala Basita has a little bit of a identity crisis. She's actually a butter, butternut squash, but anyways, what? All right, she's got, she had one more that she wants me to, wants me to tell everybody. And uh, it goes something like this. So if two vegans have a dispute, is it still a beef? All right, anyways. So today I am making Kala Basita so it's sopa calabacita, sopa means soup, and calabacita is the squash, and this is the calabacita. Um, you can see it's a little bit smaller than your typical kind of zucchini here. The other uh, uh, squash that I discovered when my wife and I have traveled to Mexico is chayote. Um, I, we were just in um, Acumel, Mexico, which is in the Mayan Riviera last year, um, and came across chayote at a local farmer's market and made some, made a little soup with it. And uh, it's just, it's just wonderful. There's just different, different tastes. So you can get the calabacita uh, at your local, um, at your local market. There's a Latino market uh, not too far from me. And um, I like, um, I like uh, to try these different uh, foods. I actually picked up a yuca, uh, which is a root. 
and um, yesterday, and so we're going to be making some uh, yucca as well. Anyway, so today I have sopa calabacita, and um, I actually got this recipe from a uh, cookbook when we went to um, San Antonio, well, gosh, I think about 15 years ago, dug it out um, just recently and veganized the recipe. Uh, to It was actually initially made with pork and chicken stock or beef stock, and so I totally veganized it. So one of the things that it calls for is pork that is uh, seasoned and blackened. So what I decided to do was take Satan um, and um, cube it up. So this is my cube Satan. And uh, I've, I've got this recipe from my Chicago Diner cookbook. If you all ever come to Chicago, you got to check out the Chicago Diner. Wonderful vegan food, uh, cheesecakes to die for, all vegan. Right, anyways, so uh, uh, we've, we've got some Satan here. And what I've got in here is my dredge. You'll see the recipe that's included in the comments on the Facebook page has actually the recipe for this dredge. And um, the dredge consists of uh, smoked paprika, garlic powder, um, uh, brown sugar, uh, a little bit of onion powder, and um, a couple of other seasonings. And then again, that's all part of the recipe. So what I do is I just put it in this bag, kind of like the old shake and bake chicken when we were growing up as kids or what have you. And um, I just drop the um, drop the cubes right in that bag there, and then just shake them up like all get out, right? And just shake, 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 shake. And, um, and then they're all nicely coated. What I did is then put them in, put them in a dry pan. Yes, folks, dry pan, because there's enough moisture uh, with the Satan, it, it had a little bit of moisture, it clung to it, all the seasoning clung to it. And then it comes out looking just like this, isn't that? Isn't that just wonderful? Isn't that just wonderful? Look at that. It's just, I mean, it looks like little pieces of pork. When I was cooking it up, uh, I was kind of playing with this recipe. I was like, wow. So I did it right in this pan. So I left all this, all this wonderful seasoning in there. Now I'm going to deglaze the pan because what we're going to do in this, I'm, I'm not going to show you the whole recipe. It's about a half hour to assemble it all. I've got it all prepared here. But while I'm while I'm while I'm going to show you one other demonstration, I'm going to throw all this wonderful Satan in my in my soup. And in the soup is um, the uh, the cube calabacita, uh, chopped onion, some garlic, cumin, whole tomatoes, and then a then a thing called the rotel tomatoes. Basically, a can of tomatoes with uh, green chilies in, and there you can find those, or you can just take canned tomatoes and throw some green chilies in and put that in there. Um, the three pounds of calabacita and then some kernel corn uh, go, you know, goes in there and it all just cooks up and in about a half hour, 25 minutes, a half hour, it's all done, you set the assault it. At the end, you throw your, your uh, Satan, uh, your, your seasoned Satan in there. And I'm gonna let this kind of heat up. But what I wanted to show you is, a, is a, one of the steps that um, we use in vegan cooking, particularly the, the type of cooking that we teach through our Food for Life classes is low to no oil. And that kind of is tough for people to get their, their mind around a little bit. And um, so basically what you're doing is you're using a hot skillet and doing a little bit of, um, what I've got here is some vegetable broth that I made. I, I save all the ends of all my vegetables that I chop up, freeze them, and then when I'm ready to make some broth, I'm gonna be hot water and let it cook down for a couple of hours and it's wonderful, right? So anyways, so, Everything's so. I, so I've already browned all my wonderful uh, Satan in with my with my rub and my shake and bake bag here, and uh, so now all these wonderful uh, uh, spices and and the sugar because it's brown sugars in there. Now watch what happens. You you're gonna deglaze this pan. You wanna get all those little bits. Watch what happens here. We're gonna we're gonna deglaze this and and it's just gonna kind of lift all those wonderful things, all those wonderful little bits up very very nicely um so you got all that seasoning and then what you do is you just put your um you put your onions in there and then you're just going to saute it but for this recipe i also had um strips of the, the green pepper so that that was all in there and then when, once once that's all nice and um softened threw it all right right into the pot you can actually do this all in the same pot as well so um 
Oh, by the way, I did have uh, I did have kind of a, a, a tough day. Just when you thought the day couldn't go, couldn't get any worse, I squashed my foot this morning. So anyways, um, so uh, you see my, my enemies are kind of close up there. Nice. So let's uh, let's play a little bit of my uh, Calabasita, Sopa Calabasita. And um, it's just, I mean, this, this stuff, is, oh, you could only, you all could only smell this and then taste it with me. It's got this uh, wonderful kind of reddish uh, soup uh, base here now because of the because of the paprika, the smoked paprika. I also use um, smoked uh, uh, chil uh, chipotle pepper in there. So again, I think somebody else was talking about the fact that they kind of play with their recipes, they kind of look at the recipes and adjust them. That's I do that all the time. Again, sopa calabacita is in in the uh, in all of our recipes there. But try it, play with it. If you don't like really spicy, leave that stuff out. So you see my onions are cooking here. Just beautiful. But anyways, so so some of the things that we might want to put on top of this are um, maybe some raw onions, like a little squeeze of lemon in that, or lime, I should say. And uh, um, then I'm also going to put some strips of tortilla right in that. And then I'm going to give this a little bit of taste. The interesting thing about uh, calabacita is uh, it's got a little bit, hmm, meatier texture, I think, than, um, than zucchini. Um, again, all these squashes are just so, uh, so cool uh, and so different. And, you know, one of my sayings that I share in all my classes, which, by the way, if you're interested in taking some classes from me, go to letseatgreat.com. It's letseatgreat.com. It's on the home page. Click on courses and classes, and you'll get to the list of all the classes that I offer. So let's eat great .com, it's the name of my company, Let's Eat Great Food. And um, one of the things that I talk about though in all my company and all my classes is, you know, we all come to veganism for our health, but we stay because of the food. And I'm sure you've you have heard of some of squashes today that you know we never, never really heard of. So so with that, um, I'm gonna bring my little friend Carla Basita. Don't tell her she's really butter squash back on and I say. Thanks a lot. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Suzanne, who's in um, Farmington Hills, Michigan. Go Big Blue. <laughs> Thank you for the big Go Blue. Appreciate that. And um, hello to your squash friend. And um, thank you so much for passing it over. So today I'm going to be making a butternut squash chili that many of my friends rave about. And most people ask me for the recipe. And like Denise, I kind of like to mix things as I go and um, vary the recipe sometimes. Sometimes I'll use sweet potatoes instead of this uh, butternut squash, or sometimes I'll use um, a winter squash or an acorn squash instead. So always please um, vary things and see how you like it. Uh, so today we're gonna start off, I already started sauteing my onions and garlic. And um, so we're gonna go ahead to the next step. So in here already is onion, garlic, and salt. And we're gonna go ahead and add two cups of vegetable broth, all of my seasonings. And today I am using a tablespoon of chili powder, a tablespoon of cumin, a tablespoon of celery seeds, and a teaspoon of berberet. So berberet is a uh, Ethiopian spice and it's a blend of a variety of spices and it has a little bit of a kick to it. So one, if you don't have berberet, don't worry, you can even just use cayenne. But if you also want to get rid of this spice, a little less spicy and just more of a savory taste, you can just use paprika. Also gives a really warm, yummy flavor. So I'm gonna go ahead and dump that in. And then I'm gonna dump in the can of tomatoes. And always fresh is best, but I also like to do things sometimes last minute, in a hurry. And so using the Instapot also makes it a little bit faster. So I do use canned tomatoes. If you are watching your salt intake, go ahead and look for ones that have low salt. You can also use a can of tomatoes that has um, green chilies in it. Again, just another bit of a, of a kick. And, and then at this point, if you wanted to blend your onions and your tomatoes and all the seasoning to make the base of your chili a little bit thicker versus a 
thin broth with a chunky chili, now would be the time to do that. But I'm not gonna do that today just because the immersion blender is a bit loud. So next I'm just gonna do is just stir this up. We're gonna add in the squash and the beans. And again, you can always cook your own beans and that is just fine and add those in once they're cooked. Um, but sometimes we're in a hurry and we just like to do things that are fast. So in here I have um, two cans of black beans and a can of chili beans. These are mixed chili beans. They're kidney beans, pinto beans, and chili. And the other thing I forgot to mention that I had them with the onions Sorry. The other thing that was in the mix with the onions was Dijon mustard. If you're not a fan of mustard, again, please feel free to leave it out. If you want to use a little bit more of a spicy mustard, you can use spicy mustard, you can use brown mustard, any variety that you like will totally work well with this dish. So at this point, what I'm going to go ahead and do is just put the lid on and turn this on. For an Instapot recipe, you can just turn it on, put it, um, have it come to pressure, cook it for about 12 to 14 minutes, and then do a quick release, which means that you turn the vent and you allow all the steam to come out quickly at once versus a slow release where you let it just cool off on its own. But always, always, always be careful when you're using a pressure cooker because the steam can burn you. So today we obviously don't have that much time for me to also cook it. So I do have a beautiful bowl of, of um, butternut squash chili here and ready. And I went ahead and garnished with some broccoli microgreens, some chopped cilantro and some jalapeno peppers. And again, this is something that you can add different greens to. You could even use different beans if you want to. You can make it more sweet by using sweet onions. I personally like a mix of red onion and sweet on and red, red onion and yellow onion to give it a little bit more of a bite. The other step that I do is once you release the pressure, I go ahead and I put in, this is about a five ounce package of baby spinach, which is a lot of spinach when you cut it, when you chop it, it sort of just fits in one small bowl. But I then dump that in right after I release the pressure, I take off the lid, I put the spinach back in, I put the lid back on for just approximately two minutes. I let it wilt the spinach and then I mix it in and serve right then. The great thing about this dish is that not only does it have a variety of um, vegetable, a fruit being a tomato, and it really encompasses our power plate with um, beans and grains. So the other thing that we also like to look at is the actual vegetables that we are eating. And so this, actually, this recipe also encompasses all of the G bombs. If you haven't heard that, it stands for greens. We have our spinach, B for beans, which have a ton of fiber and lots of um, cancer fighting properties. Our onions, which contain um, organosulfur compounds. Those are the compounds that actually make us cry when we're eating them, but they're also known to fight cancer cells and help um, decrease the speed at which tumors grow. So being that this month is October and it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I thought I would just share, share a couple of those little facts with you. Um, to go on with our G-bombs, we have M for mushrooms. So sometimes I do grind up mushrooms in a little food processor and add those to this recipe as well. And berries are a little weird to put in chili, but berries and seeds also complete our G-bombs. And it's also just a really great um, way to notice other things that we can do to help to eat foods that help fight cancer, reduce inflammation. And this recipe really encompasses all of that. So I hope you will give it a shot and enjoy. And I'm going to pass this on to Karen Osborne. Hi, Karen. Hi, Suzanne. Thank you. And welcome to my kitchen in Austin, Texas. I'm Karen Osborne, myfoodfitnessandfun.com. And today I'm going to show you a few things to do with uh, delicata squash. Um, delicata squash is also known as peanut squash. Maybe it's small and looks like a peanut. Uh, Bohemian squash or sweet potato squash. Because um, to me, a, a delicata squash, the flavor is kind of like a cross between a butternut squash and a sweet potato. It's nice and sweet and creamy. Um, they're also, um, 
short, short season. So grab them while you can. It's a fall to early winter squash. And um, there's, uh, you wanna look for ones that are really, the most important thing is that they're heavy for their size. Um, also what's helpful is when they turn um, more golden yellow, they should be sweeter. This one's a really nice color. Um, all of these are good. Um, the stripes, the lengthwise stripes, you want them to be turning orange, have some orange and some green. And um, also it, as their name, Delicata, they are delicate. So they have a really thin skin. Um, so they don't last as long, they last a few weeks, but um, the first time I saw these, I thought they were ornamental and uh, didn't know what to do with them. But, and so I didn't buy very many. And then I did try it and it was so good. When I went back, they were gone. So get them while you can. Um, you can decorate with them and then just go around your house and eat your decorations. But um, some of the things you can do with them, you can bake them, you can roast them, you can poach them. I'm gonna cut it in half in a minute and you can see how uh, they are hollow inside. So they're good for stuffing. You can put them in pastas, put them on salads. Uh, soups, anything. But here in Texas, especially in Austin, we put everything in a taco. So I'm going to be using some of the nice fall flavors in a taco. So I'm going to lower my screen so you can see what I'm doing just a bit. And the first thing I'm going to do is just cut off the ends. So I have a nice flat surface to stand up and then I'm going to cut it. I'm just going to start this. Okay, I'm going to cut it in half. And you can see it's uh, once we take the seeds out, it's a nice hollow boat to fill, which makes it fun to stuff and then bake. So I don't know if you can see that, but it's pretty easy to take out the seeds. And then we're just going to lay it flat, cut side down. I'm going to cut them in about a quarter, quarter inch slices. You can do half inch. Um, the smaller the slices, the faster they cook. But if you like a big mouthful of squash, you can cut them larger. Or you can cut them small and then just put a lot of them in your taco. So then what the next step is to just lay them out on a parchment line, parchment paper line cookie sheet. And at this point, if you are using salt, you could sprinkle some salt on there and just roast them in the oven for uh, 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how small you slice, how thin you sliced it. Um, you just want to slice them all evenly so they cook uniformly. Through the magic of Zoom, we have some that are already roasted. And I'm just going to set them aside while we finish our ingredients for the tacos. I've gone ahead and started water sauteing an onion and it's gotten soft. So what I'm going to do next is just add a can of chickpeas, give you some nice protein and fiber. If you make your chickpeas from dry like I do, it's a cup and a half of beans. And then I'm going to add some smoked paprika. So I, I like the um, nice smoky flavor. I'm going to use smoked paprika in my beans and onions. And then I'm gonna use chipotle powder in my sauce. So I'm gonna save the heat for my sauce. But if you like a lot of spice, you could actually substitute um, chipotle powder in here instead, or in addition to the smoked paprika. So we're gonna let that heat through and work on the sauce. So what I have is a cup of plant-based yogurt. You can purchase any plant-based yogurt that you like. I've made this out of a Japanese sweet potato. And if you want to find out how I made it, you can go to my Facebook page, My Food Fitness and Fun. And I have a video of making the yogurt. But anyway, you take the plant-based the plant -based yogurt, um, just add the juice of a lime. I'm 
I'm gonna add my chipotle powder. So the reason I made the sweet potato yogurt is because uh, I wanted a nice uh, low fat, no nuts and no seeds yogurt. And then I'm gonna add some garlic granules. You could use garlic powder. And that is it. Just going to stir it up. And I have my sauce. So you could put it in a Ziploc bag and snip off the corner and squeeze it in a decorative pattern over your tacos. Or if you have a squeeze bottle, you can put it in there. I'm just gonna spoon it on today to save time. And right, the beans are getting warm. I'm gonna add some apple cider vinegar just to bump it up a notch. Still let it warm a couple more minutes. This just adds more flavor. More brightness. And then when you remove it from the heat, if you choose, you can add some salt at that point. All right, so the last thing that is gonna go in the taco, well, almost. I was gonna cut, uh, like prep the pomegranate seeds in advance. So there's a lot of antioxidants, vitamins and minerals in the pomegranate. And one thing I found out is that pomegranate trees can live for over 200 years. I did not know that. But there's no right or wrong way to cut a pomegranate. There's several different ways to do it. I just thought I would show you. Um, so I cut through this side. I think it's really the bottom, but I'm gonna call it the top. So I cut through the side, only through the skin. Then I'm, I'm gonna like just pull off, remove the top. And then you can see there are uh, sections and they correspond, you might be able to see it better with the top. But some of the, uh, they, they bulge out, the sections bulge out. And so what you wanna do is see the membrane and just cut from top to bottom through each membrane. And I did pre-cut some of them, but you just through the skin. And then some people like to open these in water to uh, minimize the mess. And then pop out some of the seeds that are on top. But it's really easy at this point to just break it apart and expose the seeds. Some people turn it, uh, like take the sections and turn it upside down and just beat it with a spoon and all the seeds come out. But this is really easy to just pop some out. And our beans are ready here. So it's time to assemble the taco. Um, you can use whatever tortillas you like. I purchased them. I've made some with the blue corn uh, masa and also, if you are not eating grain, you can use a lettuce leaf. A romaine leaf makes a nice taco shell. And so what I'm going to do is first put on a little arugula. So arugula is a member of the brassica family. So it is cancer protective. And you can just pile it all on. Um, and then I'm going to, I'm gonna lower my screen just a little bit. All right, so then I'm gonna add some of the squash. You can add as many as you like. It's delicious. And then I'm gonna add my nice warm bean and onion mix. So good. And then the last, almost last. I'm gonna put the sauce on top. That's gonna hold the pomegranate seed. And Top it with the seeds. So this is so nutritious. All the colors, every color has different nutrients. 
and it's delicious. You get a pop of the pomegranate sweet and tart juice in your mouth with every bite. And I was gonna show you one more thing I do sometimes with butternut squash, I mean, a uh, delicata squash. Um, you can toss them in a bowl with thyme and onion powder and a little bit of salt if you like, and just roast them. They're so good. I'm gonna use that as a nice little side. And have a delicious delicata squash, soft tacos. So thank you for watching and I hope you'll try it. It's really easy. Um, let us know what you think about it. And now we're gonna go to Montgomery, Alabama. Carolyn Strickland, take it away. Hi everybody. Those look excellent. I love delicata squash. I love how you can eat the peel of it too when you roast it. It's just fabulous. So I, um, as you just heard, I'm Carolyn Strickland in Montgomery, Alabama, and I'm making a butternut squash mac and cheese sauce. So cheese, yeah. Um, so when people first start eating plant-based, one of the biggest things I hear is I don't think I could do that because I would miss cheese so much. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Cheese actually has been shown to be addictive and light up the same parts of your brain that morphine does. <laughs> so um, there is a reason that you feel addicted to cheese because you probably are if you're somebody who eats actual cow-based cheese a lot. So obviously what I'm making, since we are all food for life instructors and we do not eat animal-based products, um, there is no actual cow cheese in this. So we're gonna be doing some things to kind of mimic the flavor of cheese. So of course, it's not going to taste exactly like cow cheese um, and we don't really want it to, but it's much, much healthier. And it's also not going to be that neon orange color that you might be used to if you open a box of, I won't say the brand name of it, but you all know what I'm talking about when you have a prepackaged mix of that powdery orange, the neon orange stuff that you mix with milk and butter um, and pour it over macaroni. So it's not gonna be that crazy neon orange color. So, which is also good because that is a lot of artificial color we don't really need in our systems. So I am making it out of butternut squash. However, you know, butternut squash is, I wanna show you guys the biggest butternut squash thing. I, I, this is huge. This thing has to weigh like seven pounds. It is enormous. Um, you could also make it out of an acorn squash if you want to, um, just for that nice orange color. But either way, you're going to treat it about the same. So what I did was took about a cup and a half of butternut squash peeled and cubed into cubes about this big. And then I know that you heard earlier in the show how to peel. I'm not going to go through that. In fact, I have a really easy way to peel and dice butternut squash. I get my husband to do it. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to take about two, uh, one and a half cups of butternut squash and maybe a half a cup or so of Yukon Gold potatoes, those little yellow potatoes. And then I cut that into cubes as well. So it's mostly butternut squash, a little bit of potato. I've already steamed it. You wanna steam it about eight to 10 minutes just until you can get a fork through it. And then I'm putting that all in my Vitamix blender. You could use any other kind of blender you have. Um, I'm adding a um, heaping half cup. So I call it a heaping half cup, meaning you don't have to level it off across the top. Just scoop up a half cup of cashews. And I've already boiled these for about 10 minutes. You could soak them overnight. If you have a high-speed blender like a Vitamix or a Blendtec, you don't really need to do that. But I think it makes it a little bit creamier. So I add that. Now, we did have a question earlier about nuts. And so cashews are tree nuts. And some people do have allergies to tree nuts. Um, I'm actually teaching an in-person class right now, which I know sounds crazy during a pandemic, but um, it's in a really, really big room. And everybody's able to sit about six to eight feet apart. And there are right now seven participants. And so they actually get to taste the food. And one of my students is allergic to tree nuts. And so I've been trying to figure out how to redo this recipe without them. Sunflower seeds is what I would recommend because most people who are allergic to tree nuts are not also allergic to seeds. So you should be able to eat seeds. Um, if you are allergic to nuts and seeds, you could also try white beans in place. Um, these are 
roasted and unsalted sunflower seeds. So I would recommend trying that in place of the cashews. You probably also still want to soak them for a little bit. So, um, okay. So then we're adding just a little bit of milk. This is almond milk and it's unsweetened. So keep in mind, you want it to be unsweetened and not vanilla flavored because nobody wants vanilla flavored cheese sauce or vanilla flavored macaroni and cheese because that would be really gross actually. So I'm just gonna whirl this up a little bit just to get the cashews nice and creamy. And that's probably an unnecessary step if you have a high-speed blender. Um, but if you were using a non-high-speed blender, I would definitely do that step ahead of time. Um, and then we're just gonna go ahead and add the rest of the almond milk. So it's about two cups of unsweetened almond milk, soy milk. Um, you could use cashew milk, you could use, I don't know if I would try oat milk because oat milk tends to have a natural sweetness to it. And that just may be a little too sweet for macaroni and cheese. Um, and then I'm going to add two tablespoons of freshly squeezed lemon juice and two tablespoons of a dry white wine. And I wanna talk about wine for just a second. Okay, so some people are very surprised to find that not all wine is vegan or even vegetarian, which sounds crazy because it's just squished grapes, right? Well. Okay, no, not necessarily. So there are several wines out there that I would say are totally vegan. Um, this one, Pacific Redwood Organic Chardonnay is definitely vegan. It even says on the back of it that it is acceptable and suitable for vegans and vegetarians. But traditionally, we want wine to be really clear. Like if you're holding up a glass of wine and you're gonna drink a glass of wine, you don't want it to have little things floating in it. And so bits of grape or grape skin or whatever. So traditionally wine has been um, refined, not really refined, it's called fined actually, um, fining. And so they actually remove all those clumps of things um, and usually wine by itself will settle out and it doesn't even have to go through that process. But sometimes when wine producers wanna speed that up and get the stuff, the sediment in it to filter out quicker, they add things to it. And one of the more traditional ones was casein, which is a protein from dairy. And so that would not be vegan. Um, another one is albumin, which is made out of egg whites. And so that is also not vegan. Um, another one is gelatin, which is made out of the bones of cows and pigs. So that's not even vegetarian, much less vegan. Um, and then one other way they do it more traditionally is made where they filter wine through something called isinglass, um, which is actually fish bladders. So I suppose ice and glass is a nicer thing to say than fish bladders. So fish bladders would also be not vegetarian or vegan. Um, luckily, there are wine companies like Pacific Redwood and several others out there that sometimes are labeled, sometimes are labeled vegan um, that actually say it on there that it's vegan. They don't use any of those products. They're using more of like a clay kind of thing. And it's not actually in the wine, but it's something that the wine is filtered through. So you just want to watch for that when you're adding wine. Um, and then again, this is going to be put over mac and cheese. You could put it over anything, but when you heat it up, the alcohol will evaporate out. And so you're just left with that flavor. Um, and that's what we're going for here. So also Dijon mustard, just a tablespoon. We'll add that in. And then nutritional yeast. So we've talked about nutritional yeast before in previous shows, but um, this is a heaping half cup. So again, you don't have to level it off, just scoop up a half cup of nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast, remember, is not baker's yeast. It's not brewer's yeast. Um, you cannot bake with this unless you wanna add cheese flavor to something, but it is a deactivated yeast. It won't rise. It's just used, um, in vegan cooking and vegetarian cooking as a cheese flavor. So, um, and it has, it imparts a very nice cheesy flavor to things. Um, it's also known in vegan circles as nooch or vegan catnip is another <laughs> term for it. So, and I'm also adding a starch of some kind. So you could use potato starch, corn starch, 
Um, I am using, um, or tapioca starch, I'm using arrowroot, which is also a starch. And there's just um, two tablespoons of that. And then I'm going to add some seasoning. So I have salt, onion powder, garlic powder, smoked chili, um, smoked paprika, and a little bit of fresh ground pepper. And again, the recipes are all going to be on our Facebook page. So you should be able to, they're probably already on there. So you should be able to take a look at that. Um, and then one last ingredient that I'm adding is um, something called lactic acid. And most of the time, lactic acid is something that's sourced from dairy products. However, um, and it's what gives cheese that kind of sour flavor, aside from the fermentation, it gives cheese that kind of sour flavor that people are used to. And so there's actually products that you can buy on the market that are made of this vegan Lactic acid is sourced from sugar beets. And so it gives it a nice sour flavoring. I just got this on Amazon. It's a company called Druid Grove, Druid's Grove, but there are several um, on there. So it gives it a nice sour flavor. You don't have to add that. And if you don't want to go on Amazon and order something, it's kind of hard to find in stores, but Amazon has plenty of it. So you could look for vegan lactic acid and it's not very expensive. So, and it does give it a more sour cheese-like flavor. Okay, so I'm going to whirl that all up. That is all of the ingredients. And the cornstarch that's in here, um, cornstarch, arrowroot powder, whatever kind of starch you wanna use is going to help thicken it a little bit. So it actually is nice and creamy and cheesy looking. So it's hard to see, but it's, it's thick and it will thicken up as it cooks. So if you wanna use it over a bowl of beans and rice and roasted vegetables, I would suggest just putting it in a saucepan and heat it up a little bit until it really starts to thicken. Um, what I've done with it today is I made a macaroni and cheese. So I used shells, but you can also more traditionally use elbow macaroni. You could use brown rice pasta if you're someone who doesn't eat regular flour-based pasta. Um, this one is made of completely semolina flour and that is it. That is the only ingredient. So, which I tend to look for those in the store. Um, the fewer ingredients, the better. And then I will show you how this looks. There we go. So this is shells, not elbow macaroni, but well, it's kind of overexposed there. But um, yeah, so it's nice and thick and you wanna use more sauce than you think you need if you're making macaroni and cheese because the pasta will soak up some of the sauce as it cooks. So I put in more and it seemed kind of soupy going into the pan. There's no soupiness left to this now. So the pasta has soaked up all of that yummy sauce. As you can see, there's no nothing running down there. So it's all nice and creamy and delicious. And then I put on top of it some panko breadcrumbs. Um, you could use panko. Those are traditional Japanese style. They're just sort of a thicker, crunchier breadcrumb. You could also use just regular breadcrumbs. You could take your own whole grain bread, toast it and whirl it up in a food processor and make your own breadcrumbs. I do that a lot of times, that's perfectly fine, but you know, to be fast, use store-bought ones. Um, just look at the ingredients, make sure there's nothing in it but breadcrumbs um, and there's no added um, eggs or things like that. So I just sprinkle that on top and baked it at 375 for about 25, 30 minutes until the breadcrumbs start to brown on top and it starts smelling really good and it gets bubbling and, you know. So again, it does not taste exactly like that store-bought box of mac and cheese. Um, it's better so, and it's way better for you. There's no cholesterol, it's low in saturated fat. So yeah, it's absolutely delicious. And if you have gone without eating any actual cow-based cheese in quite a while, then it will definitely taste cheesy to you um, without all the negative parts that we associate with actual cow-based cheese. So, and again, you could drizzle it over, you know, a sweet potato with black beans and some roasted vegetables in it, use it for, you're gonna have more in here than you need for an eight, ounce, eight ounces of pasta in a mac and cheese. So um, I hope you'll give it a try.
And I am going to now kick it back over to Dilip in North Carolina because we are going to questions and answers. Thanks, Carolyn. That cheese sauce, that vegan cheese sauce looked really good. And who would have known from squash? <laughs> <laughs> it's delicious. Great. So um, I'm wondering if there's some um, questions that came in on Facebook. And while we're waiting, I wanted to ask one. And that is, would somebody like to talk about, we, we focused, I certainly focused, and I think all of us did, on <clears throat> winter squash. And, uh, and let's throw this open to all, everybody, including Calabacita. <laughs> 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 even, though, even though Calabacita may not know much about summer squash, but can anybody share some information about how you would work with summer squash as opposed to winter squash? So does anybody want to take that? I, I like summer squash. I don't like it nearly as much as winter squash. What I do with summer squash is usually quite different. What I like to do is I sometimes serve it raw in a salad, slice it, slice it thin perhaps, uh, or I like to saute it. I, I saute without oil. So I'll take a, maybe a cast iron pan and I'll slice some uh, summer squash and I'll, I'll simply saute it or I'll uh, cook it into a stew. Does anybody else have any suggestions of what you do with summer squash? <clears throat> Um, I, zucchini squash, yellow um, squash, I just like, I think um, Donna made, when we did our so many vegetables, made zucchini patties. Mm -hmm. So I uh, like to do that. Um, those are really good. I also like you, I like to cut the zucchini a little bit thicker and use it for dip or roast it on the grill. Um, but I, I um, you know, eat it raw in salads. So just cook it. Um, there's a great food for life recipe that is a calabasas similar to um, our butternut squash friend that uses the zucchini squash, onions, tomatoes, and corn, and a little chili and cumin. That is really, really good. So um, I mostly like it raw, but it is good cooked too. Mm, I really like to make um, zucchini noodles and run oh. it through a you know, noodle maker and have them raw and then put a, um, like a Thai peanut sauce over it and have raw Pad Thai. Oh, nice. I you like stuffed zucchini. zucchini. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can make, uh, make appetizers, slicing it in rounds and then put a little vegan cheese on top and a little cherry tomato or mm -hmm. anything you choose, basil. And that all I like sounds to, good. I like to make zucchini tacos, so it's, um, zucchini, mushrooms, green onions. You saute, you know, the mushrooms and green onions, and then you throw in the zucchini at the end and you have a spicy, like a enchilada sauce. And roasted or toasted sunflower seeds go on top of the tacos after they're filled with some lettuce and the filling. And I also like to air fry, cut them in about half inch rounds and put them in my air fryer and they are delicious. Denise, actually, I had a question for you. I believe you used to own a raw food restaurant, and um, Food for Life doesn't really take a position on raw foods. We, um, and we're not really talking about raw foods today, but I, I did want to bring up, um, can you, because I'm kind of curious myself, can you cook, if you do want to have additional raw foods in your diet, can you take winter squash and, and cook it raw? Can you, not, can you prepare it raw? Is there things you can do with winter squash? Yeah, and like I had said, you know, you can take it raw, put it in your blender with some nut milk and some spices or some broth and, um, and make a soup. You know, we, when I had the restaurant, we ate everything cold. So we, I would make raw soups and so the butternut squash would not be cooked. Um, you can put things in the dehydrator. So I've made, uh, we had a dinner and movie every month. And so for that dinner, um, one time I made um, butternut squash ravioli. So where that neck is nice and round, I just slice it on my mandolin real thin and fill them with a mushroom onion filling and put that in the dehydrator. And so the dehydrator takes the water out. So it makes it like their cooked pasta. It was amazing. Nobody could tell that it wasn't pasta or that it wasn't cooked. So, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. Even um, zucchini taking, making zucchini nests. So taking shredded zucchini or spiralized zucchini and um, putting it in a circle and putting that in the dehydrator um, and it makes it down, cooks it down. So we call it zucchini nest and you can fill it with 
different mushrooms or marinated stuff. So, and, and there was an interesting question that came in. Uh, you were talking about blending and a question came in about uh, Vitamix. And I know all of us, I think, probably use the Vitamix. So would somebody um, else like to talk about your Vitamix and what you do with your Vitamix? Denise had a really good, some good suggestions. Um, maybe Suzanne, would you like to share a little bit of what you do with your Vitamix? Sure. Well, I first bought the Vitamix years ago, um, even before I was working, a really long time ago. And I did that because I really wanted just to make smoothies and have a way to um, make a large amount of smoothies. My kids were younger then, and I really enjoyed feeding them veggies in the morning because it's important, I think, to have vegetables with every meal. So it was a great way to give them a smoothie. And we usually do three vegetables to one fruit. So you get a little bit of sweetness, but more of the health benefit um, in our morning smoothies. So that's kind of how I started using a Vitamix and then started making hummus, dips, um, salad dressings. You can even make soup in a Vitamix because the friction creates heat. So it's a much, um, you know, it's, it'll be more of like a blended, very creamy based soup. But um, sometimes I'll just make a pot of soup on the stove. I'll put half of it into the Vitamix, um, blend that, and then pour it back in to mix it together. That was I used to do that before I had an immersion blender. But there are lots of great things you can make um, in a Vitamix. One other thing that I used to make in a Vitamix, um, was ice cream, just not so much cream, but we would we use coconut milk, but mainly just frozen fruit blended together, frozen bananas. Um, it's delicious. So there's lots and lots of ways to use your blender. Right, and we and there are other good blenders too. I understand Blendtec is also supposed to be an excellent blender. Um, I love my Vitamix. I have I think three mm -hmm. Vitamixes. <laughs> and uh, one thing I would throw in is. Um, um, we, we encourage people to eat plant-based and we don't think you really need to spend a lot of money. So uh, there are certain dishes, like I love ice cream too, and I make it, I throw frozen fruit in and just a teeny bit of plant milk. Uh, and we demonstrated that in the fruit show, uh, mm -hmm. if you got a chance to see that. But if you're not using a high powered blender like a Vitamix, be careful because a less expensive blender, the blades can get, the, the whole blender can get damaged. Um, so you can, if you follow a recipe like Suzanne's recipe or my ice cream recipe or any number of other people's recipe, um, first, partially de uh, defrost the fruit uh, so it's not as hard. But yeah, I, I think having a Vitamix for me is a game changer, but it's expensive. And, um, you know, uh, we encourage you to eat vegan, whole food, plant-based. And um, if the money's there and, and you can afford it, then it's a, it's a great way to go. But, but don't sweat it. You don't, you don't need a Vitamix to eat well. Does anybody else want to share anything about Vitamixes? Yeah, so Mark. this is Mark. Yeah, so... Um, I don't have a Vitamix. I have a Ninja Blender, which isn't as expensive as a uh, Vitamix. And we went to one of the local, um, you know, kitchen and bath uh, suppliers and got it. And I tell you what, it is, it's a game changer because I had one of those old Westinghouse uh, uh, blenders that probably uh, was over 30 years old and was a hand-me-down. And I smoked it, um, to your point, when I was trying to make some ice cream. And um, so we went out and got... Um, a rel relatively reasonable uh, ninja and it was as maybe 75 or 100 dollars somewhere in there and i know vitamix could go into the hundreds so 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 that's an option as well but i agree with you you know um i i didn't get a ninja blender probably for a good year or so into eating full plant-based um you know low oil so there's so many other things there um that that you can make and desserts you can make as well if you don't if you don't have one of those high speed blenders. I was also wondering, you know, um, I don't know this answer, but what is the difference between like the Vitamix uh, blender and like a Ninja or high speed blender? Is there is there a difference? Yeah, so I know a little bit about that. So a Vitamix is not as sharp. The blades aren't sharp. If you look at a regular blender, they're sharp. A Vitamix is dull. And the way it works is that it hits. It, it basically is punching the food <laughs> and, and fractionating it that way instead of, instead of uh, chopping it. Yeah. And, and it goes at, just like Suzanne said, I think it's like 200 miles an hour or something like that. When I make, uh, sometimes I make a carrot ginger soup. Um, then um, uh, it goes so fast that it, it brings the soup to a, a very warm temperature. Oh, I see. Interesting. Yeah, it's the whole power 
um, for the Vitamix that really makes it work. And that's why they last so long too. Um, you know, but food processors are a great alternative to a blender. It's not gonna blend everything smooth, but you can make hummus and you can make soups. You can make a lot of things in, the food, in a good food, food processor. Um, it does help to have some machines. My, you know, my uh, Nutribullet has been my go-to. I use it more than I use my Vitamix anymore just because I don't make large quantities of food on a regular basis. But I love it because I've got all different sizes. You know, I've got a two cup to a four cup and a three cup so I can make all different types. And the new Vitamixes I found interesting, they actually have um, cups with lids that you can stick right on the Vitamix. You can stick it right on there and blend in like a smoothie cup. And, so you oh, nice. and a question, question came in, uh, Janet Holsapfel Staley, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your middle name, but a uh, question came in is, do I still need my food processor? And it's a good question because when, when I got married, uh, my wife had a food processor and um, we hardly ever used it and we, we really don't use it anymore. So I find that, uh, you know, and Janet was asking, maybe it's better for dry ingredients. If you do a lot of dry, using a lot of dry ingredients, Vitamix actually sells a separate um, uh, container for, for dry ingredients. You can make your own bread from wheat berries, for example. So um, I, I like having minimal appliances. And so one less thing is, is nice. For me, when my daughter grows up, I'm gonna send her to college with a, with a Vitamix, <laughs> um, a Salad Master pan, and we'll talk about cookware some other time, but Salad Master is wonderful because it's solid. It's great stainless and titanium pans and uh, with an Instant Pot. That's what I think would be good for, for college. I, I wanted to go on to, there was something about improvising and I, I um, seeing Mark's wonderful uh, friend, uh, Calabata, <laughs> I'm not going to Calabasita. Calabasita. So there, there you are. Hi. So you see how versatile squash is and how you can improvise and do things with, with squash. And I, I wanted to take a moment and share a little bit about my way of improvising and then I'd love others to, to also share. So to me, um, uh, cooking is about improvising. If you have, it, it's, it's rare that you have a dish where one ingredient is, well, I shouldn't say that, but oftentimes ingredients can be substituted. So if I'm cooking, for example, a dish and I'm out of onions, maybe I have some shallots or maybe I have some extra garlic or something like that. So I like, I have this challenge for myself. Ever since I met my wife, it's been, uh, we just celebrated our 15th anniversary this week. So we've known each other like 17 years and not once have I repeated a dinner for her in 17 years. And I'm sorry to my other cooks because you've heard me say it ad nauseum, <laughs> I'm sorry. I like to brag, not, not so much to put focus on me, but to show how easy it is to be plant-based. If I can do it for 17 years, every night I'm creating something new, then others can. And, and the way I do it is through improvising. So um, when you get ingredients, try marrying different ingredients together. When you go shopping, look for things and say, hey, I've never had this. I wonder what this would be like. But I'd love for other cooks to also share a little about your improvising. Would um, uh, Karen, would you like to share something about how you improvise when you cook? Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, okay, good. All right. Um, basically, I um, so one thing you can do is just try to get something of every color on your plate, and and that's a good way uh, to know without knowing what's in it. You know, you're getting a lot of nutrition. Um, I like to always have some kind of bean and some kind of green and uh, something with vitamin C. That's good for collagen building. It's good for your skin and your bones. Um, I, I rarely use a recipe. Uh, recipe is just a guide. Maybe if I find a recipe, I'll make it one time, maybe the way that it says, just to go from there and, um, and see what I can learn from that and then uh, use what ingredients I have. I love to go to the store and just see what looks good and buy it, not knowing what I'm going to do with it. Bring it home and uh, and experiment. Um, it, it's just it's more fun that way for me. I know uh, a lot of people just want a recipe, and what I hope to do with uh, what I'm doing is show people that you really don't need a recipe to invent taste. Angelita, can you share how you um, improvise in your cooking? 
Uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> whenever I go to a store, I love to go to different stores. Uh, I live in Greenville, South Carolina, so I travel to a Hong Kong market in Atlanta. So I'm going through the aisles and I'm like, oh, I wonder what this says. Oh, I wonder what this tastes like, you know. And so then I come home and I kind of research what it is that I bought. And then for something just clicks and I'm like, well, you know, this might taste good with this. So I don't have an issue with taking what is like a traditional Mexican meal and adding an Italian flair to it or an Oriental meal and adding, I don't know, jalapenos to it or um, apples or something. I'm, you know, to me, cooking in a, is an art and we're the artists. Now I have some made some things that Lord, uh, you know, I won't ever make again because nobody, <laughs> not even myself. But then I've made some things that are, that I was just like, oh my gosh, I never thought that that would taste so good. Um, so I, I just opened up the cupboards and I'm like, okay, I've got this, this, and this, what am I going to make? And I just throw it together. Um, last night, as a matter of fact, I had a butternut squash, so I roasted it. And then I was like, okay, well, I don't want just butternut squash. Then I realized, oh, I've got whole wheat um, orzo. Oh, I've got sun-dried tomatoes. I've got Colorado olives. Um, so I put all that together and then just made this wonderful salad. And it was nice and warm. And I served it um, with, oh, what was it? I think it was soy ginger or something like that. And then today I had that same salad, but I used a balsamic glaze on top of it. So it completely changed the flavor, even though the main ingredient was the same. Um, so I just tell my clients, I'm like, just have fun. Don't be scared, you know, just try it, you know, and, and you'll be amazed and you'll learn something. And then that same meal can carry on to something else. You can add something else, artichoke heart to it for tonight. So I, I don't have a problem with inventing stuff, you know. <laughs> I, I, I feel like for my husband sometimes though, because he's like, Mmm, that's good. <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, you win some, you lose some, uh, and it's all about learning and not being scared to try new things. I think that's one thing that's common amongst all of us is we all have share a love for food. And um, I, I've so loved getting to know many of us cooks in the kitchen haven't met each other. And doesn't it feel like we're family? We've done so many of these shows so far. And I, uh, I'm hoping after the pandemic that maybe we could do one of these shows live from somebody's, from somebody's kitchen. And uh, when we meet, it'll John be like- is. John is. John is in Italy. Let's go to Italy. <laughs> and, I, I and, keep volunteering. <laughs> and, that, and that reminds me, I, I wanted to ask John and you a question in terms of flexibility and, and using things. Uh, I was wondering, because you are in Italy, you're one of our non-US uh, cooks in the kitchen. We also have uh, cooks in the Caribbean and in Brazil. Uh, but Jean, and I'm wondering how the food varies because you've also spent time in the United States and I believe Turkey. So let's stick to squash for now, one particular food, because that's what our show is about. How have you found the flavors change when you go, uh, if you get squash? First of all, the varieties that are available, are they more, are they less in Europe? Do you, you get certain uh, heirloom varieties, other varieties we don't get? Uh, is the flavor different? Because of course, as soils change, the flavor also changes. So I thought maybe you could spend a little bit of time talking about, because mm -hmm. Italy is known for its, its wonderful food. Yeah, um, there wonderful fresh veggies and um, fruits here. Sometimes I have trouble because um, speaking about books and recipes, I can't always find the right ingredients. But then if you're a excited cook who can mix things up like Angelita was saying, or like any one of us that, that has been saying, um, then you can make do. For example, um, if you recall at the beginning of uh, when we were planning for this show, I said, I couldn't really tell you what kind of squash I'm gonna have because it's not so consistent here. Um, when I go to the market today in the uh, local vegetable market, there were only big um, beige colored pumpkins um, and nothing else. But um, I had gone to another market yesterday 
And there they had a few pumpkins, one, some that were uh, dark green colored and some that were silvery looking and some were beige, but still the typical pumpkin. And then looking at a few stalls, I finally found the um, butternut squash. And I wanted to do butternut squash because I love the flavor of it. But I was able to find two. One was about this size and the next one was that big. I see my hands can't even fit in the screen. Um, it's huge and there's no consistency because I think there's not so much the squash culture here. I mean, as we do in the US, um, we have the acorn, the butternut, the spaghetti squash, etc. I can't find those. However, whatever produce I find, especially at the local vegetable market, it's just um, uh, very, very delicious, very tasty. And I buy all my veggies at the local vegetable um, market because it's the local farmers and they care how they farm. They're farming in smaller quantities. Even I converted a few of my neighbors who are long-term long um, residents of this area because they used to think I was crazy for buying my carrots from the local 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 vegetable market from this guy who has um, organic farm. And they were saying, no, it's all a gimmick. Uh, he's buying the yucky looking vegetables from the wholesalers and selling it to you. However, once they tried the raw carrot sticks at my house and they said, wait a second, this tastes like a carrot from my childhood. And now they're all going to the same farmer at our local farmer's market and buying carrots from him. So um, yeah, I make do with what vegetables I can find. For example, here I cannot find um, celery root, celery ac. Um, it's just not common. I mean, I love it. I used it um, all growing up. I could find it everywhere and parsnips, I can't find them. Um, some of the veggies are just not in the culture here, therefore I don't have them and I have to improvise, um, do recipes with different vegetables, but what I find is very high quality and I'm happy with it. So speaking of ingredients, Karen, I wanted to turn to you for a second and I know a question came in on Facebook we can cover after that, but Karen, can you um, talk a little bit about pomegranate? That was so cool what you said. If I, correct me if I'm wrong, you said pomegranate trees can live 200 years. And, and before you answer that, I wanted to also throw in um, pomegranate is so rich in color. And, and when we see fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. bright in color, that generally means they're strong in phytochemicals, which are disease fighting. What I do with, with um, pomegranate is I often put it in a bowl of water and I chop it in the water so we don't have splashing because I don't want to have pomegranate juice. I, I like pomegranate juice, but I don't want it on my clothes. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit more about pomegranate? And it's, it's a biblical food as mentioned in the Bible and probably other holy books. <laughs> and and uh, opening it in the water is also good because the seeds float or uh, sink and then all that white stuff floats to the top and then it's really easy to just take it out and uh, strain the water out and you have all these wonderful seeds but they are high real high in antioxidants that help fight free radicals and just about every disease like fight or prevent um like it can thin your blood like lower your blood pressure um prevent or cardiovascular disease even helps fight diabetes um anti-inflammatory so uh, lowers your risk of cancer and stroke and also it um it helps the keep the ldl from oxidizing the, uh, in your cholesterol um and it also is a source of uh, culinary nitrates which is um, actually good for um for exer like exercise recovery like you want to eat beets and uh, and pomegranates. They're a little bit expensive, um, but I it's just a, a treat certain times of the year, and I think it's totally worth it. Um, I just I wanted to mention something. Um, the other question about improvising just made me remember a book that I had in culinary school, and it's a really really fun book. It's called The Flavor Bible. And in here, you can look up ingredients mm. that you have. So you want to make something that you have and 
um, it's in alphabetical order. And then you can just look up what it'll list things that go well with that food, um, other foods and, and spices, herbs and spices. And I mean, it's just fun to, to play with. So it is uh, the Flavor Bible by Karen Page and Andrew Dornenberg. That sounds really, really good. Um, sounds a good idea. Suzanne, I know you're watching Facebook. Uh, I think that some new questions have come in. Do you see any new questions, Susanna? Yes, I was just responding to one. So let me respond to it. Um, and then I will uh, let you know the other ones. But oh my gosh, I'm not going to spell or pronounce your name right. It's A-N-J-A-L-I. Anjali. Anjali. Okay. Anjali, sorry about that. But she had asked um, about buying a spaghetti squash and it had a green sprout in it. And yes, once you see it sprouted inside, that means that it's old and oftentimes it will taste very bitter. So unfortunately, the best thing to do is to um, throw it away if you um, have seeds sprouted in it. So um, or, or compost it. Right, right, <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know if the squirrels I like to put out, if I don't use celery or um, kale stalks or other stalks, I like to put it out where we have a lot of squirrels and bunnies. Um, so um, definitely compost or feed your animals. Um, I actually had one and I planted the sprout and oh. I got another spaghetti squash. Oh, That's wow. <laughs> To buy one and just leave it and then do that for next year. That's a great, great idea. Um, but Carolyn, there was a question for you about substituting the nuts. Everything, um, everything. I, yeah, <laughs> I saw the question. So yeah, yeah. substituting uh, nuts, the, the nuts, the seeds, grains, legumes, and nightshades. So yeah, um, okay. So, and then, uh, Further part of the question was also about the lactic acid that I showed a little while ago saying, aren't sugar beets almost always GMO? So I was looking at this package that I showed you guys before, the Druid's Grove lactic acid, and it says right on it very clearly non-GMO. So um, this one is non-GMO. And yes, I'm assuming that probably just like most corn grown in our country, is genetically modified because most corn is actually fed to animals. Um, most sugar beets grown in our country is actually then refined into sugar that's put in all kinds of things um, like Skittles and that sort of stuff. So, um, but these are, this is made from non-GMO sugar beets um, and it's not that expensive. So as far as the substitutions go, okay. So I found this the other day at the store. It's the new forks over knives issue oh, of and forks over knives this. is whole food plant-based lifestyle magazine i found it at whole foods the other day and i bought it specifically because the front cover shows healthy comfort foods and it has mac and cheese on the cover so i was very interested in that and it has a lot of roasted vegetables on the top which looks delicious and that's usually how i serve mine too with a bunch of roasted vegetables their cheese sauce actually um has oats, which I know that's technically a grain, um, but it's not one that tends to be a lot, very allergenic. So it calls for a cup of oats, nutritional yeast, cornstarch, but roasted red peppers. And I can't remember, are red peppers in the nightshade family? That I don't remember. I know eggplant and potatoes. Pepper, peppers are, are nightshade. Peppers, peppers are, are they? Yeah. Uh, okay. But you could also use sweet potato or carrots. And so I have made lots and lots of different sauces like this out of, of with carrots in them potatoes, instead, potatoes. Um, or with sweet potatoes, but sweet potatoes are not actually related to white potato. I know they're both called potato, okay. but they're not really in the same family. So um, sweet, potato, are, uh, sweet potatoes like, are should sweet not potatoes actually be in the shape. potato family? No, so oh, okay. no, cool. they are a root vegetable. They happen to just get really big underground, but they are not actually potatoes. So um, they should not be in the nightshade family as far as no, I know. If not potato um, then. Yeah, so sweet potato, you could do that. Um, instead of using almond milk, um, you could use coconut milk and unsweetened coconut milk. Um, let's see, let me think. The other question, so in place of cashews, yeah, that's, that's gonna be hard. I would suggest 
Yeah. So my usual substitutes for cashews are going to be seeds or white beans. And so if you're asking for no seeds or no legumes, so I'm not really sure what else you would use to thicken it at that point. Does anybody have any ideas that could replace um, nuts, seeds, or beans or potatoes to thicken something? I, I can't really. Maybe corriginin or some, um, some seaweed product. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that it already has the starch in it to help thicken it up. Um, arrowroot powder arrowroot. It actually really does that, or tapioca starch. Now that really thickens things, especially if you heat it and you're cooking it um, while stirring, you know, and you have to keep stirring it, but you could put tapioca starch in instead and then put it on the stove top and stir. So let's say maybe you could put in carrots and sweet potatoes and some tapioca starch and coconut milk, then hopefully that's removing all your nuts, seeds, grains, legumes, and nightshades, which is, uh, that's, a, that's a totally different recipe than what I just made, <laughs> but, but yeah. <laughs> um, there's also plantain flour that I've been using to thicken up stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that might work. <clears throat> that could and, work, um, yeah. Yeah, and I bought that at the Hispanic market. Um, so, and it doesn't really have a flavor. So that, that also might be an option. That's, that's an option. Do you have to cook it like you would tapioca starch? Uh, well, I haven't. I mean, I just, as it, as whatever I'm cooking, I just put it in there with the liquid one-to-one -one, and then right. just, um, it just thickens up on its own that way. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know tapioca starch will thicken up as you cook it. I actually make a, um, mozzarella cheese that my husband likes to call glop cheese <laughs> but because you glop it on top of the pizza but you know it comes out big and gloppy in chunks but when you bake it on a pizza it's melty and stretchy and everything but it has tapioca starch in it so that's the only thing I could think of besides the plantain flour that's an idea um, so yeah if you don't have nuts or seeds or grains or beans or potatoes that's that's you know that's uh, that's a hard call but yeah like i said you could use sweet potatoes carrots coconut milk um yeah and then more of the lactic acid to give it more of that sour flavor because this is non-gmo um yeah that's that's a it's a tough one but <laughs> that's also Our Different sour recipe. flavor. <laughs> There's other ways to get uh, uh, sour flavors too, like an Some Indian lemon juice in, in or something. Lemon juice. Lemon juice. In well, I did add lemon juice to it too, but mm. yeah. T Tamarind would be oh. a good choice. In, in South Indian cooking, uh, one of my favorite foods is called dosa. And mm. uh, uh, you simply blend it. We blend it in our Vitamix. You soak some rice and some lentils, and they naturally ferment and, and give a sour flavor. Mm. Mm. Um, I wanted to very quickly, because you had mentioned, um, Carolyn, nuts, and I wanted to throw out for our audience, we are, uh, we talked about whole food plant-based eating, and we talked about watching the fats. Mm. Uh, that's probably, um, I, I think those of you in the audience <laughs> who are interested in plant-based eating probably aren't surprised by many of the things we say. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who are promoting plant-based eating, and why? Because it works. It's It seems to be a magic bullet for almost to keep us healthy, and if you're struggling with cancer, diabetes, heart disease, guess what? Probably the most effective thing, of course, you should check with your healthcare provider, but from what I read, probably the most effective thing you can do is to be plant-based. There are credible people out there who have different opinions and different evidence they cite on fat. We do suggest 10% fat calories. And the reason 10% is when you go beyond 10%, every single study that talks about reversal of any kind of, um, any kind of disease progression goes away at 10%. And that's why we suggest 10%. So if you are enjoying Thanksgiving, and this is going to lead to the next comment I want to make, or, or a holiday, and you go out someplace, I host, it's the country's biggest vegetarian Thanksgiving. This year it's takeout. But in general, we get people from, from California, upstate New York, Florida, here in North Carolina. Uh, we do have dishes which are higher in fat. But what we suggest is if you uh, keep your overall average uh, to 10%, and occasionally you're you're eating um, you're eating higher fat, but if your overall average is ten percent, that's that's really the way to go. So with nuts, what we suggest <laughs> is um, if if you're going to eat nuts, then make it a small handful a day. And um, nuts do have some nice nutritive properties, omega threes. You can find this in other foods as well. But I, I thought we would start wrapping up soon. I don't think there's too many more questions, and we're ten minutes after. Were any of the cooks? Does anybody? 
Uh, and then I want to see if anybody wants to say anything, then I wanted to wrap up with talking about our next show. So does anybody want to throw anything else in or does anybody see a question I missed on, uh, on Facebook? No, but I just found out that sweet potatoes are in the same family with the morning glories. Yep, that's true. The flower looks very <laughs> similar to morning glories. Mm -hmm. So definitely not nightshade. I, I do see one question on Facebook. Uh, There's a question about okara and I'll quickly answer that. And maybe somebody can talk about tapioca starch. So Anjali Lati, I recently mm -hmm. heard tapioca starch is highly processed with toxic ingredients. I'll see if one of you can handle that. Suzanne Hansen, does anyone know how to use okara? So uh, okara is great. It's if you are uh, making your own soy milk, which we do in my family. So when you're done making the soy milk, you're left with this white uh, mass, which is the soybean mass. Um, we can't get through it enough, so we generally compost it. But what we can do, and I sometimes do, is I take it and I make it a patty out of it. I coat it with jerk seasoning, nutritional yeast, whatever I'd like, and often I air fry it or pan, pan saute it or something of that nature, and you can make burgers. But you know what else I've been doing with Okara recently is my daughter recently got braces. And when she first got braces, she had to be very careful what she ate. And so I was making a lot of smoothies for her. The cold made her, you know, felt good for her, for her teeth, for her braces. And to add extra nutrition, I threw in some of the Okara. It didn't add much flavor, but it added a, a nutritional power punch. And so that would be something else that you could do with Okara. Would... Um, Somebody else like to take uh, the tapioca starch question? I'm talking about the... that because I've, okay. I've got a big bag of it right here to show you. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so this is the kind that I use. This is Anthony's uh, organic tapioca flour. It's gluten-free, vegan, non-GMO, organic. Um, it is actually just cassava root that has been dehydrated and ground up. That is it. It is cassava root, and that is all. So there is nothing else in here but organic cassava root. So tapioca starch is also known as tapioca flour. It is the same thing. All it is is ground up dried cassava root. So you might find some out there that is labeled, doesn't say organic, doesn't say gluten-free, doesn't say vegan, doesn't say non-GMO. I might avoid that. So in this case, this one is organic, gluten-free, non-GMO, um, and nothing but 100% cassava root. So, you know, there may be some out there that are more processed, but the process is basically just dehydrating cassava root and grinding it up into a flour. So, you know, and I don't know if cassava root is a nightshade. That one I don't know, but I don't think I'll so. Look so, yeah, look it up. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think so. Up. But I don't think so. And it's really just a great, it's just used in binding things. Um, but it is more activated if it's heated. So like a thickener for soups and sauces is what it even suggests on the bag. It's a grain-free flour. Um, it's unmodified and perfect as a thickener in soups and sauces. And like I said, I make mozzarella cheese out of this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not a nightshade. Well, there we go. So tapioca flour, buy the, buy the good kind that's organic. And, you know, I don't know anybody in this company. I'm just saying this is, this is the kind I use. So, and I got it on Amazon. But. There's a question that came in from Nancy Scott. Could konjac root be used as a thickener? And I've never heard of konjac mm -hmm. root. I'm sure one of you has. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love hanging out with Food for Life instructors because uh, uh, there's many things I don't know. And when I don't know things, lots of you guys do know. <laughs> so who's heard of konjac root and who can answer that question? Looks like Karen knows something about it and she has it. <laughs> so uh, it, it is a root. Um, it's starchy and uh, people use it like to lower blood sugar. Um, it's a lot of fiber, it is a fiber. And you can just add a small amount to a blender full of something and, um, and blend it uh, and it'll, it'll thicken it up. Um, if you add too much, it'll gel it. So um, it's, a, it's not flavored at all, it's, it's very bland. Um, do you want to make sure you drink a lot with it? Also, with like psyllium, psyllium husk, you could use to, for the same reason. There was, a, I, this might be the last question. Somebody, Anjali, is asking uh, tapioca starch by definition is the processed version of cassava flour. Processing ingredients don't have to be listed. Does anybody want to reflect on that? 
not according to the back of the package. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm reading the back of the package and it says it is only organic cassava. It is one of the purest forms of starch based food and has been used for eons in various regions throughout the world. Um, this says our, our bag is uh, just starchy, veg a starchy vegetable known as cassava root. It's a grain-free flour. Finely ground tapioca is unmodified and perfect as a thickener in soups and sauces. It is not modified in any way. And yeah, so, I mean, I would look at this one, you know, because this one seems, this was the best one I could find when I went looking for it. Um, but it's, you could go on to their website, anthonysgoods.com. Um, or find it on Amazon. But according to their package, it is just cassava, cassava root dehydrated and ground up. But let's, you know. let's take, uh, I don't see more questions. Let's, cause we're, we're, um, we've gone, I think, good length of time. We really appreciate everybody joining us. And those of you who are watching us live, it's wonderful, enjoy getting your questions. And we know many people will be seeing it after the fact here on Facebook, as well as on Plant-Based Network. So squash, this was a great show. I really loved it. I love squash. And while I was um, waiting for Q&A, I was eating my dish and I was also enjoying uh, the, 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 the squash itself. Yeah, <laughs> Squ squash is such a, such a not only nutrient dish, but f dish, uh, nutrient rich, but flavor rich dish. Mm -hmm. uh, so those of you, I know many people uh, are busy and don't have time in the kitchen. You know, if you have a pressure cooker, throw some squash in and and a few minutes later, you'll have squash or, you know, bake it, uh, but it's ready to go. You don't have to be a fancy chef like many of us are. You can just cook the squash and, and eat it as is. You can put, you know, some cranberries, some raisins, what have you, or, or just eat as, as you wish. I, I, I love squash with nothing. Before I, was, um, whole, before I was a Food for Life instructor, I would put a little bit of vegan butter or earth balance and uh, I find it doesn't need it. I mean, it's so rich and so tasty, just plain squash. But, you know, if you're cooking squash for a friend, feel free to add, add something like that. I wanted to, just before we end, just do a quick announcement of our next show and then maybe go around and have each of us take a moment and talk about the holidays because uh, in much of the world, there are a number of holidays coming up, whether it's Thanksgiving in the US, our Canadian friends already celebrated it. Uh, there's <clears throat> Passover just passed, uh, Eid and Ramadan, Diwali is coming up soon, um, and uh, uh, Kwanzaa isn't far behind. There's lots of important holidays coming up. So to that effect, we just yesterday, I think, decided our next show, I think it's November 7th, don't hold me to it, but I think it's November 7th. And uh, uh, I, I pushed back a little bit. I said, let's not do Thanksgiving because all of our dishes could be Thanksgiving side dishes, but I was overruled. So we're going to do a Thanksgiving event, which I think will be great. Uh, and we're going to present each of us who, who cooks that day. We'll talk about what we like for Thanksgiving. What are some good side dishes? Because as you know, uh, whether you're a um, vegan or omnivore, Thanksgiving is made up of all these side dishes. I think that's really what makes the event. So, um, and then we have a December show and we are talking about maybe desserts. What are your favorite holiday desserts? So I thought we could close today's show going around uh, with, uh, maybe we'll start with Mark and his friend, Salabita, or sorry, I'm not going to speak Spanish. And go it. around and- <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you know, the reason I have trouble remembering it is because your friend is awfully seedy. <laughs> that was a very cheesy joke. Oh, so, <laughs> you squashed it. I, I, thought we could, I thought we could go around and if each of you could, um, you know, let, let's maybe focus on Thanksgiving because that's coming up next, I think, or, or any upcoming holiday. What what would you do if you are preparing, if, if you want to, what's one of your favorite dishes to prepare for the holidays? Just briefly. So, Mark? Well, yeah, I love um, stuffing and gravy. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that's yeah. like the number one side. <clears throat> for me. Give me a big plate of stuffing um and some nice and i have got a lovely lovely mushroom recipe mushroom gravy recipe that um i mm. used and you would you would not know the difference it's just amazing and it's one of those things again you know we become vegan for the our health but we stay because of all this wonderful wonderful food susanna what are your thoughts for the holidays 
Well, my favorites, um, I am right in agreement with Mark's stuffing, but I'm not so much a gravy. I'd add mashed potatoes. So stuffing and garlicky mashed potatoes mm. are what typically <clears throat> filled my plate before I became plant-based because I never really cared for turkey. I, I just didn't. And um, now I'll add sweet potatoes and other things, but stuffing and potatoes, hands down, have to be in huge amounts on Thanksgiving in our house. Karen, what do you what comes to mind for you uh, preparing for the holidays? Oh, I am going to do a, a really fresh, delicious cranberry relish, which is um, it was a tradition in our family even before we. Uh, Went fully but it um, it's just so fresh, uh, so much better than the stuff that comes out of a can, and um, <coughs> raw. And, but people, you know, people were eating it and not even realizing they're eating raw vegan food. Suzanne, what comes to mind for you for the holidays? I have to admit, I really love desserts. <laughs> I tend to jump to those first. Um, but I'll be good and have a little bit of something. So usually I will make a mushroom and green bean casserole. Mm -hmm. I also love to use mushrooms um, in uh, <coughs> corn for stuffing and um, a vegan pumpkin pie is always delicious. The other thing I do is make brownies out of zucchini. Actually, I probably should have mentioned it. Wow. Mentioned it that it, um, X is a lot of like moisture and it really holds it together and it actually makes a very delicious chewy brownie. So Sounds that's great. So great. Angelita, what are your thoughts on holidays? Well, um, because I'm Mexican, traditionally we would make uh, tamales. Uh, so oh, I will be making no. grapefruit tamales with some poblano peppers. That's, um, that's what I've been working on now, trying to get the flour because it's usually, I mean, the, the masa, the dough, uh, <clears throat> usually it's made with lard. To, and, uh, so I'm having just a little bit of a difficulty trying to get that consistency, but that's what I'll be making will be the jackfruit mm -hmm. and we'll for some of this. Wonderful. Shannon, what does what do holidays look like for you? Well, uh... Squash. <laughs> <laughs> I also, um, I, I like them as a side dish and I love also making um, oven roasted uh, Brussels sprouts. And then I toss them in together with walnuts and some little bit of um, dressing on it. And um, another thing I love are green beans. I like that, oh, my battery's running low. Um, the, um, if I'm out of here, it's because my battery is running low. Um, yeah, green beans is always a staple on our table for, for the holidays. John and I are having some very friendly competition right now. Who's going to put some Brussels sprouts <laughs> for holidays? We both love them. So we'll figure that out. Uh, no, those of you, I, when you see our so shows. There's so many recipes. There's so many recipes. Behind the scenes, there's a lot going on between the shows. So, <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, what, what do holidays mean in your ha household? So Thanksgiving has always been my favorite holiday. I even have this little uh, Mark, I'll see your calabacita and raise you my little turkey. This is, <laughs> this is my little vegetarian turkey with her little chef's hat on. And she's actually holding a little cookbook that says vegetarian cooking. <laughs> so, I've been cooking this way a long time. This, this little gal is old, but um, I love all all the side dishes at um, Thanksgiving. My, I mean, golly, I make um, a roasted garlic gravy that is just like, I could just eat it by the bathtub full. It's so good, it's just delicious. Um, with mashed potatoes and cauliflower, I do like to throw some, ca some cauliflower into my mashed potatoes, up the nutrition a little bit. Um, pumpkin cheesecake bites are one of my Ooh. favorite things too so that's a, we should do a whole show on just desserts sometime I think that would probably be very popular <laughs> so um and throwing pumpkin into chocolate muffins and that kind of thing is is delicious too so um yeah I, I like all of the side dishes um I've never been a huge mushroom fan and I feel like a bad vegan saying that but but last year I started making a um 
green bean casserole with fresh mushrooms in it that ended up being really good. And I actually liked that. So I'm getting better about the mushroom thing. I think it's a texture thing for me, but I'm trying. So, and the thing I'm making for our next show actually has mushrooms in it. So, and you wow. can't even, you can't even, I know I'm so proud of myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know you mentioned green beans? So the Thanksgiving I put on, I think it was two years ago, was I think the 50th anniversary mm -hmm. of the invention of the green bean casserole by, I forgot her name. I think she's since passed away. So we featured green bean casserole at our Thanksgiving. <clears throat> oh, awesome. Great. I think everybody except me went for holidays, right? Did I miss anybody by accident? I have a bad memory. I think we got everybody. Mm -hmm. So so for me, for, I didn't miss anybody, did I? I'm so. I love some. <laughs> so, so I'm off the hook because I host this huge Thanksgiving and I, uh, the restaurant is all vegan. It's, it's amazingly good food. And I invite you guys to look us up, trianglevegsociety.org. Uh, this year it's takeout. I don't think we'll get any people from out of town, but b believe it or not, we have regulars from across the country. A couple families have been coming from Canada and we used to sell out in less than two minutes and we have about mm, 650 wow. seats. So now we do a lottery so that we can fill the seats. And wow. yeah, if we didn't, we'd wow. fill in, you know, we fill very, very quickly. So Long my pandemic, this has to be over with soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So oh. so it's takeout only this year. Yeah. Um, my, my, what I like for holidays is um, I love cooking with seitan. And many of us won't be familiar with that. Seitan is processed, uh, it's wheat gluten, it's cooked wheat gluten, you boil it, and I've made it from scratch, I don't like my homemade wheat gluten, but it's been like 20 years since I made it, I need to try it again, I bet I could do a better job now, uh, so I buy seitan, uh, and what I do with my seitan, this is one of my published recipes, is um, it's my uh, lime marinated jerked seitan, so mm. I take seitan, and I let it sit in lime juice. I love lime. I let it sit in lime for overnight if possible or a few hours. And then I dredge it in a spicy jerk seasoning. Jerk is a Jamaican seasoning that includes chili powder and oregano and, and other flavors. You can make your own jerk. We have a company nearby that one, makes wonderful jerk, different kinds of jerk seasoning. So I use theirs. So I dredge it in that. And then in the old days, before I knew about oil, before I was a food for life instructor, I used to use uh, oil. So I would, I would saute it with just a little bit of olive oil. And now what I do is I put it in my air fryer and uh, it's, it's so tasty, um, uh, lime marinated jerk seitan. So with that, does anybody have any final thoughts otherwise? This has been a great show. I, I personally am so excited to be able to share squash. Um, it was a good story for me. My, my daughter was on earlier and she, as I said, generally doesn't like squash and at least she told me she liked everything I made. Apparently on the show, she said the first few things weren't so good. But by the end, she said it was great and she really liked it. And to me, that's, um, that's a success to have my daughter who doesn't like squash really enjoying. Um, I would suggest to you try different flavors like I did with the grape. Uh, and that'll add to the, the, the flavor textures and make you a, a better cook perhaps. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you guys. I think it's November 7th. Please stay tuned mm -hmm. and uh, feel free to keep asking questions on Facebook and we'll be happy to answer them. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.